Yeah. Can hear you, Gordon. I'm going to guess the, a CR, the, uh, nine bucks. I'm going to right. guess a, a CR Eight, 2023. <laughs> Maybe a CR 2022. Uh, where is everybody? Yeah. We've got a, all the staff here. Um, So we do have forum. So we can start. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I know I'm, I'm, I, it's it's an indoc it's a, a training session, and um, we've got um, haven't got a lot of newbies here yet. Uh, Councillor Mazin is here. <laughs> she's not a newbie, but well, a, she's here. We well, I'm a newbie counselor. I'm going to say I'm not newbie to planning. Yeah. Okay. I even have a question for the training <laughs> session. I'm going to mute. Rob, I don't have any volume. Can you hear no, me? No, you're good. You're good, Sally. They're just not talking. We're just sitting, waiting, doing nothing. <laughs> no, we're. Can you hear us? Yes. Now I can hear you. Okay. Morning, Councillor Moyer King. Yes, I can hear you now. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Rob Bosenworth here is chair of the planning committee. I want to kick off the meeting this morning at 835. I will call it to order. I will verbally confirm that we have uh, all of the councillors short of Councillor Nishikawa and Councillor uh, McIntyre. Um, I confirm that the CAO uh, Director Pink is here and other staff members in support of the meeting. Um, the, uh, the public agenda was uh, published and uh, in public was invited to, to input at the following email address, which is planning at muskokalakes.ca. Today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded at the Township of Muskoka Lakes website and the YouTube channel. By participating in the open meeting today, you are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded and posted online. Um, I acknowledge that we have no supplementary agenda. Is that correct? Thank you very much. Uh, and I will ask any of the councillors present if they have uh, any disclosure of pecuniary, pecuniary interest. Seeing none. Um, the, uh, I, I guess I can state now that our motions have been pre-populated pre with random movers and seconder, seconders to expedite the meeting, uh, but that no, in no way uh, confirms the outcome. Uh, the first item on our agenda this morning is um, a delegation by Director Pink on, um, on, uh, on the orientation for Councillors, so over to you, Director Pink. Thank you, Chair. Oops. Uh, good morning. Oops. Getting feedback. Yeah. 
So good morning, uh, uh, committee. Can everyone hear me? Um, so uh, welcome. Uh, staff and I uh, look forward to working with you in the next uh, four years on this uh, uh, busy committee. Uh, for those who uh, don't know me, my name is uh, David Pink. I'm the Director of Development Services and Environmental Sustainability. Um, I uh, started at the, uh, at the township in 2004 uh, as a uh, planner, worked up in the planning department, actually a uh, senior planner, director of planning, and now uh, the director of development services. Uh, I do have a, a bachelor of science and a master of environmental science and usually live in Bracebridge uh, with my wife and uh, two children who keep me quite, uh, quite busy. So if we could start the presentation now, let's... So next slide. Oops. Yeah, I just have to scroll down. So the Development Services and Environmental Sustainability Department is responsible for four primary areas, uh, economic development, uh, planning, building, and bylaw enforcement. Our uh, economic development officer is Mr. Corey Moore, manager of planning is Bryce Sharp, our chief building official is Nick Snyder, and our chief bylaw enforcement officer is Mr. Rob Kennedy. And before going into uh, more detail or a functional review of each of these areas. I just want to highlight uh, how integrated these areas or these functions are. They are all interrelated. They work uh, quite closely with one another uh, as illustrated on the, on the next slide. And it can be viewed somewhat as a cycle uh, with economic development and the planning teams working together on establishing the conditions and land use policies to allow the community to grow and flourish and the environment to be protected. And this is followed by planning and bylaw staff who create bylaws and work with council uh, to implement the vision set by council or to implement those policies that uh, just spoke to. Uh, the planning and building teams then review development applications and they manage building permit applications against those policies and those bylaws uh, submitted by constituents uh, developing in the municipality. And then lastly, those bylaws uh, and those municipal requirements are enforced. The cycle then largely repeats as we continuously review and evaluate the success of existing policies, bylaws, and enforcement action and update as necessary. So all four areas work uh, quite closely with one another uh, with really the same main theme or goal in mind. And certainly strengthening the social and economic fabric of the community is of significant importance as well, but preserving and protecting the natural and cultural environment is paramount. Uh, many people say the economy is largely based on the environment here, and that's evidenced clearly in the township's strategic and official plans. Uh, so next slide. Um, getting into uh, each functional area, I'll start with economic development, uh, where it's quite common many people ask or have perhaps different viewpoints of what exactly that is. Uh, unlike in many uh, more urban settings, economic development in the township is not, in my opinion, about bringing in heavy industry or manufacturing jobs or, or strictly employment. It's really about community building uh, or working with our partners to create the conditions that improve the economic well-being of the community. Uh, the function has a, a lot of tasks uh, or goals, and to name a few, they uh, assist and provide support for local businesses. Uh, including connecting them with local resources. Uh, it aims to enhance community infrastructure uh, through means such as the recently approved community improvement plan, which has items such as street furniture and wayne finding signage. You'll, you'll see that on the upcoming budget discussion. Um, this uh, functional area markets and promotes the township through promotional literature, our website, social media, executing our brand strategy, et cetera. Uh, as well as supports product and experience development and marketing to increase year-round tourism. Also researches and pursues all possible funding opportunities uh, to promote and enhance the township 
and works with partners to assess and improve workforce challenges. Uh, the function is guided by the economic development strategy, uh, whose vision is to create the condition that allow residences, uh, residents, businesses, and the environment to flourish. And to do so, it focuses on three priorities, uh, key economic drivers, such as housing, workforce, and broadband, uh, and providing existing business support, and diversifying the local economy. Uh, next slide. So you'll see after each functional, um, sir, uh, functional area, I'll just touch on some of the key service enhancements as I've titled it, are really continuous improvement projects that your term uh, will uh, become involved with. Uh, and that, uh, those led by the economic development team include uh, implementation of the recently approved community improvement plan. And that includes both the private and public sector initiatives and development passage and implementation of a climate adaptation and climate mitigation plans, uh, which you will start to see uh, in early 2023. So next slide. Uh, moving on to planning, uh, I think I would start by stressing we are largely a creature of the province, and that's really evidenced by uh, some of the recent changes uh, that we'll discuss uh, later on in today's agenda. Um, the Planning Act is the piece of provincial legislation that sets the framework for the planning team to work within, stipulates requirements for essentially all planning processes and applications, uh, timelines, etc. The province then sets a high-level overarching policy document for the entire province. It's titled the Provincial Policy Statement. It's often abbreviated PPS, of which all planning decisions that you make must be consistent with. Uh, we are a two-tier governance structure in Muskoka, so the next policy document is the Muskoka Official Plan, uh, which planning bylaws passed by Council must conform with. And as we drill down to a more local context, the next policy document is the Township Official Plan. The Township in late 2022, just uh, a few months ago, adopted a new official plan, and it directs that regard shall be had to its contents. Uh, before it is approved by the district. So you'll start seeing in some of our staff reports uh, reference to uh, both the existing and the adopted official plan. And those policies are then all implemented primarily through the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw, although other bylaws as well. Uh, the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw is 2014-14. Uh, it was passed in early 2015. When a zoning bylaw amendment, a minor variance, consent, or other planning application are made, township planning staff review that application against the policies in these documents, together with a site visit. Um, site visits we do on all virtually every uh, planning application that's submitted, and we use that information to then formulate an opinion and recommendation to council. Public input is also an important component of the planning process, and should issues arise at a public meeting when committee is considering an application, Keep in mind that matters can always be deferred for an update, uh, an updated staff report or further information. Uh, committees should be cognizant, however, of statutory timelines under the Planning Act. Recommendations from this committee on planning applications proceed to council on the following month for ratification and any deferrals add to the timeline. Uh, recent changes to the Planning Act will require the township to actually refund planning fees if decisions are now not made on a timely basis. So uh, that's something the province is uh, stressing recently in some updated legislation. So next slide. So as just reviewed, the township official plan is a master planning document. It's used to guide future development and decisions on land use, built form and the environment amongst other matters. Policies within are implemented primarily through a zoning bylaw. What the zoning bylaw does is assign a zone through a, a mapping or a schedule of every property in the township. And it provides a set of detailed provisions for each zone surrounding permitted land uses, setbacks, density, height, et cetera. If a landowner complies with the zoning bylaw and all applicable law, they are able to apply for a building permit. If they cannot comply with the zoning bylaw, on the next slide, we'll go over some planning applications. Up until very recently, site plan control was the next step in the process. This process is used to protect environmental features and enables the control of specific matters on a property undergoing development with obligations stemming from the approval typically enshrined in an agreement that we register on title. 
There are a number of other, uh, what we call tools in our planning toolbox at the township's disposal, uh, but these are the main ones and staff recommends the most appropriate for the matter at hand. Ultimately, the main end goal of the planning process is to, as we talked about earlier, ensure the environment is preserved and protected. And for the majority of development that we typically experience in the township, as is depicted on that picture, uh, what we're aiming for is a nice natural shoreline where the natural form dominates and the environment is protected. I would note, uh, you'll see the uh, caveat there, as a result of recent legislative changes through Bill 23, uh, the majority of development the township experiences will now not be subjected to the site plan process and of course uh, you may have noticed later on the agenda these changes and potential alternative tools uh, will be discussed uh, later on today's agenda both the current and adopted official plan and the comprehensive zoning bylaw are available on the township website i believe returning councillors should have paper copies but for those new councillors who wish to obtain a paper copy if they uh, still prefer uh, paper, please reach out to me after the meeting and staff will uh, provide those for you. Next slide, please. So when a property owner wants to undertake development, uh, a number of planning applications will potentially come into play and you will become familiar with these over your term. Uh, but the following provides committee with a brief highlight of those applications uh, that more commonly arise. When a proposed development does not conform with the official plan, an official plan amendment application is able to be submitted. It's not a very common application. You may deal with approximately one to two per year. A public meeting must be held and the Planning Act requires that a decision be made in 120 days. And when I say a decision, that is from uh, staff uh, deeming the application complete uh, to when council actually passes a bylaw or in this case adopts the policy. So Township Council, in the case of an official plan amendment, if supportive, would adopt the policy or amendment. And keep in mind, in these applications, the District of Muskoka, uh, District of Muskoka is the ultimate approval authority. And the final decision can be appealed. When a proposed development uh, does not comply with the zoning bylaw, or a rezoning or a change in the end, uh, land use is envisioned, a zoning bylaw amendment application can be made. Uh, this is a more common application. You'll likely have about three to six public meetings on every agenda of this type of application. The Planning Act requires a decision in 90 days. And again, Planning Committee makes a recommendation to Council after receiving input from staff, agencies, and the community. And Township Council makes the final decision in this case. But again, uh, decisions of Council can be appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal. When relief is needed from the zoning bylaw for a development uh, that again does not comply with the zoning bylaw and it's considered minor in nature and meets the four tests laid out under the planning act a minor variance may be sought uh, council has established a committee of adjustment to make uh, to make decisions on these applications so you won't see them uh, and the township receives quite many typically around uh, 80 to 100 per year uh, give or take See Councillor Roberts' hands up. I'm happy to take questions in between, or uh, we can wait to the end and leave it to the committee and chair. Or prefer. So. I'm waiting for the chair. Reconnecting or? Okay. Okay. Keep going. We're good. Okay. So again, on the uh, uh, minor variance applications, the Planning Act does require a public hearing to be held in those cases within 30 days of receipt of the application. Uh, these decisions again can be appealed. However, as a result of Bill 23, uh, now only the applicant or a prescribed body can appeal decisions of a minor variance. Uh, 
so there are a number of uh, prescribed bodies uh, laid out under the new legislation. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me, but they're typically agencies such as Hydro or um, Bell or a municipality uh, of those nature. So it's it's typically a public agency uh, or the applicant. So in other words, really the uh, neighboring property owner uh, no longer has appeal rights should an application be uh, approved. So moving on to consent applications, to convey any interest in land, a consent application is required. And I'll have a bit more information on that process on the next slide. Um, but if the proposed changes uh, to the land fabric comply with the zoning bylaw, the Committee of Adjustment hears uh, those requests, so you won't see those. However, if the changes uh, to lot lines do not comply with the zoning bylaw, and the application, the consent application is submitted concurrently with the zoning bylaw amendment, it will come before this committee as a public meeting. The Planning Act requires a decision on consent applications in 90 days. These decisions, again, can be appealed. However, again, as a result of Bill 23, uh, now only by the applicant or a prescribed body. So prior to the issuance of a building permit for compliant development, certain buildings do have to go through, it's called the site plan approval process that we touched on. This process does not require a public meeting and it reviews the more specific details of the property in relation to the development proposed, matters such as stormwater control, servicing, vegetation and buffers, lighting and more. Upon a approval of the set uh, of any necessary drawings, the municipality does have the ability to require an agreement with the landowner, which details obligations, including the collection of securities to ensure completion of any works. This agreement can be registered on title and is binding on future owners. Uh, while Bill 23 does remove the process for the majority of the development, the township, uh, commercial and larger scale residential development will still be subject to it. Uh, Bill 109, which was passed uh, previously, uh, requires that approval of these drawings be delegated to staff and a decision is required in 30 days. Uh, Bill 109, however, will shortly increase this to 60 days, I believe on January 1st. Only the applicant has a right to appeal uh, this process should a timely decision uh, not be made. Uh, next, the District of Muskoka is the approval authority for subdivision and condominium applications. Township Council will be circulated and staff will prepare a report so that committee can comment on them if they so wish. Uh, these are not overly common applications in the township. You may see a few in your term. So as just uh, reviewed by each application, most planning decisions that council or the Committee of Adjustment makes on applications can be appealed uh, to the Ontario Land Tribunal. If this occurs, uh, the litigation process is usually then discussed by council in camera, where the township solicitor receives instructions from council. It's important to note that members of the community have the right to make these applications. You may often hear comments uh, from the community questioning how council can even consider certain applications or to defend the bylaws or that bylaws are not meant to be broken or amended or similar such type of comment. While the Planning Act gives council the authority to pass a zoning bylaw, the Planning Act also gives members of the public the right to make an application to amend or receive relief from the zoning bylaw. If bylaws were not able to be amended, this right wouldn't be enshrined. Going before a tribunal uh, or a, a public hearing with the main position that we are standing behind our bylaws is typically not a successful argument uh, through that process. And it's important to note also that it, you'll likely hear me say this throughout the term, it's, it's largely impossible to craft a one size fits all zoning bylaw that works for the entire township and every unique situation and every unique property within our boundaries. The vast majority of applications that you will hear have merit in relation to these unique circumstances and are supported by property owners. So while neighbors do have a right to object, uh, it is important to note and remember that property owners do have the right to apply. So next, uh, next slide. So very briefly touching on consent applications, as they are somewhat unique to most applications before a committee. Uh, keep in mind, consent is required when any owner of land wishes to subdivide a property, change lot lines, grant a right of way or easement. If the number of lots proposed is substantial, typically uh, more than five applicants will be directed to the plan of subdivision process through the district. If the 
uh, application is approved, conditions are able to be imposed on that approval, and the Planning Act lays out a timeline of two years by which they must be fulfilled. Uh, staff administer this process after the approval, and once all conditions are satisfactorily fulfilled, a deed or transfer can be stamped, uh, which must be registered by the applicant uh, to finalize the process. Again, the Committee of Adjustment will hear most applications for consent, but those needing an accompanying zoning bylaw will come before a planning committee for consideration. So next slide, please. Uh, major continuous improvement projects or key service enhancements for the planning team during this term include, most notably, uh, as a result of the recent adoption of the new official plan, an updated zoning bylaw. Uh, this will be a major project for this term. Uh, the Planning Act requires that the zoning bylaw be updated upon passage of the new official plan. And staff would note that in order to replace the site plan control tool uh, recently lost through Bill 23, it's likely that this new zoning bylaw will be in the form of a community planning permit system and more information and discussion on that topic uh, again later on the agenda. Planning is also moving to an online application submission and tracking portal, which will assist both staff and the community in the processing of applications and is as well working on additional GIS mapping layers so that more information is available 24 seven at the fingertips of our constituents. Next slide. Moving to building. Uh, once the planning process is complete and a proposed development complies with the zoning bylaw and all applicable law and has site plan approval if required, an owner may proceed to apply for a building permit to commence construction. The building team's main function is to enforce the Building Code Act and administer the Ontario Building Code. Uh, to do so, council has the duty to appoint a chief building official and any necessary inspectors to complete these functions. These individuals receive, process and complete building permit application reviews, issue or refuse building permits, conduct inspections, and where necessary, prosecute. Fees are established by bylaw and must not exceed the reasonable cost to administer and enforce the Building Code Act. And in other terms, there is no impact to the taxpayer owing to the building division, they are fully funded through permit fees. Uh, complete, and the key word here is complete, applications must be reviewed within legislated timelines. Uh, for most construction in the township, typically 10 business days, but can range up to 30 business days depending on the scope of work proposed. And staff are required to conduct inspections upon request within two business days. It's very important to note that the chief building official must issue a building permit upon receipt of all required information and compliance with all applicable law. This is not discretionary and it's not open to influence. Any person who considers themselves aggrieved by an order or a decision of the chief building official may appeal to the Superior Court of Justice within 20 days after that decision or order. The building team also administers the Township Septic Reinspection Program. And I'll touch on that uh, just briefly on the next slide, please. So key service enhancements for the building team during this term include starting on January 3, 2023, a move to e-permitting uh, or the online submission of building permit applications, issuance of building permits and scheduling of inspections. This will improve building staff's engagement with the community, allowing applicants to track their application progress online and improve coordination of the building process. Uh, the previous term of council also recently approved a new septic reinspection program and implementation starting in 2023 will be a significant project for staff. Uh, previously, two seasonal staff were retained annually by the township to conduct uh, largely cursory type inspections, uh, typically of a specified area or a specific lake in which concerns may have been previously raised. The new program categorizes every sewage system in the township based on a risk level and subjects them to a mandated inspection frequency and level of inspection based on that risk level. A business case is included in your 2023 budget packages uh, to secure the necessary resources to commence implementation of this project. Uh, lastly, similarly to planning, a pilot project is currently underway to improve online GIS mapping. That does include additional uh, building information. Uh, next slide. The final functional area is that of bylaw enforcement. Uh, this division is responsible for achieving compliance with municipal bylaws 
and requirements through education and enforcement. It is important to note that when bylaws are contravened, that is not, as we often hear, an indication of a failure or lack of enforcement. The municipality does not have the resources nor the ability to prevent every owner from ever committing a contravention or violation. Violations from certain individuals will always occur. The team's goal is to obtain compliance through a number of means at their disposal. Council may pass regulatory bylaws under the provisions of provincial statutes, such as the Municipal Act, Planning Act, Highway Traffic Act, and others to regulate activities and properties within the township. A number of bylaws are currently in place, ranging from protections to the dark sky, tree preservation and site alteration, to noise, parking, and exotic animals, to name but a few. A recently approved policy and procedural manual outlines potential enforcement actions where investigations have revealed a violation has occurred. These range from education and voluntary compliance, and where that's not successful, or it's where it's determined appropriate, written notice or orders to issuance of part one or part three charges. Each situation has its own unique set of circumstances and bylaw enforcement officers are qualified and tasked with having the discretion to determine the most appropriate response to all complaints received after a thorough investigation. And while the specifics of individual investigations and enforcement are not disclosed to the public or council, staff does report to committee on a biannual basis with respect to the amount of complaints received, charges laid, et cetera. Bylaw enforcement staff are also responsible for property standards matters, typically working in conjunction with building staff, as well as the approval of licenses such as refreshment vehicles, taxis, and kennels, amongst others. Uh, last but not least, if a member of council receives a complaint or inquiry from a constituent or witnesses any potential violation, staff highly recommends not to become involved and to encourage the individual or to do so on their behalf to fill out an online complaint form on the township's website under the report of concern tab or phone or come into the office to file a complaint. It's staff's role to then conduct an impartial investigation into the matter and take any steps if necessary to achieve compliance. Uh, next slide, please. Major projects uh, for the bylaw team are many for this term. Uh, these include ongoing reviews and updates to those regulatory bylaws we just discussed. Uh, first on deck early next year, you'll see the Dark Sky Bylaw come forward uh, to improved education and engagement to the community, both of considerable importance. Uh, the largest projects, however, will likely be on short-term rentals and the administrative monetary penalty system, or what you'll hear me call AMPS. Uh, the previous term of council recently directed that staff update a short-term licensing bylaw that was prepared by staff many years ago and bring it back to committee for review. Uh, this is anticipated in early 2023, and that will be followed up with public consultation and engagement with the goal of hopefully enacting controls to be put in place for the 2024 year. Uh, the AMP system will also need to be in place for these new regulations to be effective. And similarly, council recently directed staff to put the resources in place in the 2023 budget uh, to begin implementation of the AMP system, and you'll see that in your budget packages. Uh, AMPS essentially provides the authority to require a person to pay an administrative penalty if the municipality is satisfied that a violation has occurred. It's intended to provide municipalities a method other than charges via a provincial offence notice and to avoid having bylaw infractions go through the court process, allowing the provincial court system the ability to concentrate on other matters. Uh, felt more appropriate to hear within a court of law. So it's essentially establishing uh, a court system within the township and we have the ability to set the, the fines uh, and administer that process. So quite administratively heavy, uh, but some benefits to that and you will see a report early in the, in the next year on that topic. Uh, so that uh, sums up the four uh, functional areas and I am available uh, for any questions. I hope committee finds that helpful. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions over the course of the term and staff and I are here to assist you uh, throughout. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Pink. Um, 
being no questions, I guess we will move on to the. Oh, Council Roberts. I beg your pardon. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair, and through you, um, Director Pink, that was excellent. Um, it, far, far better than four years ago. <laughs> we were given a a quick a quick overview, but this this really helped explain a lot of some. And one 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 slide in particular, the penny dropped for me. So uh, I won't mention which one, but it it did drop <laughs> for me. Um, and I would like you to remind committee. Um, you you on one of the slides there, you were you listed all the types of the zoning bylaw and the consent, and you talked about um, lead or times time frames. Uh, for the zoning bylaw, you said six months. Um, far be it for me to say what I think that is. But can you tell me what when that clock starts on those applications, please? And I believe that I also on the online application submission system, that date will probably be in, in that application. Correct. Thank you. Uh, through the chair. Um, that is, uh, that is correct. I think it might be helpful to just quickly outline, uh, sort of the seed or the planning process and, uh, sort of well-timed you'll notice later on today's agenda is actually a report on a, a mandatory pre-consultation bylaw. So what happens, uh, most applicants do, uh, pre-consult with municipal staff prior to submitting an application. However, it's never been mandatory at the township and that's quite common amongst our peers. I think it's long overdue at the township, but I know sometimes there's a lot of concerns with applications. I think a good lesson for council off the off the hop is keep in mind staff a lot of times weed out a lot of applications that you'll never see. Uh, you wouldn't believe some of the inquiries that constituents come to us with and ideas or visions of how they'd like to develop their land. And we indicate to them at a very earlier stage that this does not conform with the official plan uh, or the PPS or the district policies and a lot of applications are not made. So the first step will be a mandatory pre-consultation with staff. And then once the application is submitted, staff have 30 days to deem it complete. And when we say deem it complete, what that is is essentially staff and council has all the necessary information in which to make an informed decision. Doesn't mean you will approve it, just means you have all the necessary information to make an informed decision on that application. Once staff have deemed that application complete and that authority has been delegated to staff, that's when the timeline starts. At that point, we're then required to notify neighboring property owners, notify certain agencies, and schedule a public meeting. That public meeting, um, yeah, more recently through the more recent procedural bylaws, does occur before a planning committee. Well, there's many ways to set up the process, but they will occur before you. You see several on today's agenda. And if committee, after hearing from the community, after hearing from staff, after hearing from agencies, is ready to make a decision. Planning committee makes a recommendation to council. The following month, council considers the bylaw. Any submission received right until council makes a decision forms part of the record and part of the file and preserves property owners appeal rights. And again, that, that timeline that I referred to will go from uh, deeming that application complete until council makes that decision. Um, it's almost I believe, uh, in every situation after that decision, there's 20 days for certain members who have the ability to, to appeal that decision to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Once you go to the Ontario Land Tribunal, timelines uh, become less predictable and quite lengthy. Um, but for our process, typically you'll see anywhere from 60 to 90 to 120 days, depending on the, uh, the process. Uh, the province tinkers with those dates uh, quite often, so uh, they do fluctuate, but uh, uh, the ones I just went over are what the current requirements are. I hope that explains a little bit more detail uh, what applicants go through and uh, staff's processing of those and then ultimately committee's involvement with them. Thank you, Director Pink. Uh, Councillor Edwards, you have a question. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, when you're saying registered on, on title, so we do a bylaw uh, in that, does it give it more strength when we register it on uh, title? So. Uh, future uh, owners know exactly what council wanted and that does it and it that does it work better um, 
through you. Uh, unfortunately, the volume was off just at the beginning of the uh, of your comments, but I think the question was our ability to register uh, bylaws or documents on title and the effectiveness of that. Um, keep in mind, uh, we need authority to uh, under some legislation in order to be able to register under Land Registry Act items on title. Uh, zoning bylaws are not one of those documents. So the zoning bylaws that you'll deal with regularly do not get registered on title, but they do run with the lands. Uh, they get held in the vault, they're signed by the mayor and clerk after the meeting, and they're held in the vault and they are applicable until such time as a council repeals or amends them. There are a number of agreements under the Planning Act. And when you saw the slide that speaks to planning tools, there's a lot of different uh, agreements, whether it's a consent agreement, a minor variance agreement, a site plan agreement, those can be registered on title. It is almost always the township's practice to register them on title. That's our common practice. And I think there's a great benefit to doing so. A lot of property owners, when they acquire lands, uh, they may not hire uh, a lawyer to search title or sorry, to uh, do a municipal record search. They may not be aware of every minor variance or zoning bylaw implication, but every lawyer does search title and they will advise the purchaser of obligations uh, on title that run with the lands. And it's helpful to include those types of agreements there. Uh, so that they are binding on future owners and they are noticed uh, more regularly. So I hope that answered the, the question. Um, I see no more questions. Any more questions? Councillor Mizzen. Uh, thank you, Mr. You, Chair. Um, looking at that same slide, the planning application side, slide, where you um, kind of just highlighted each of the kind of significant ones we will be going through. I recall us having a planning process map at some point, which I suspect is now going to get modified and changed as we consider a uh, community permit planning. Is that something that we could have access to again? at some point or just as part of our review, I found that to be very helpful. Um, through the chair, I think what you may be referring to, there was um, earlier in the last term, I think on two occasions, we did, staff did propose uh, delegating authority of certain consent decisions to staff. And we laid out a flow chart of the uh, planning process or the touch points of council and staff. Um, one for the other process is not jumping to mind, but if a uh, uh, committee would find that helpful, staff can certainly create something and uh, provide to uh, uh, to councillors. There are a number of uh, guides on our website to the processes, and we do have uh, flow charts within those. So we can uh, uh, we can provide those. As you, I think, correctly noted, um, the whole process may undergo fairly substantial changes if we move to a community planning permit system. So, um, and I'm happy to go into more detail on that on the Bill 23 report uh, later if, if committee members have questions on that process. Um, but we can uh, we can provide those flow charts or, or provide the links on our website to the, to the various processes. Thank you, Director Pink. Uh, are there any more questions? I see more, no more, then we will move on to the uh, next agenda item. And of course, we're now into uh, the planning and development services part of the agenda. We have no um, other public meeting or official plan amendment applications and concurrent or concurrent uh, zoning bylaw amendments and consent applications. So we will move uh, right into the zoning bylaw amendment applications. Um, I will remind uh, committee members that you each have chances to have uh, two, two questions at this, and we will limit, try to limit uh, everybody to that. Uh, once we get through all the, all the committee members uh, and, and we still have some uh, perceived time at the end, we may uh, allow some extra questions at the end, but uh, in the efficiency of the meeting, we'll try to stick to that. So the first, um, the first application is Zoning Bylaw Amendment 34-32, Bylaw 2022-139, Lang, uh, Lot 31, Concession 8, Part 2, Plan 135R-11802 in Windermere. And the planner on that is Mr. Soya. So if we could, if you could start, that'd be great. Thank you, Chair Bozemorth. Uh, good morning, members of the committee and members of the public. And also uh, hello to those new councillors that I've not yet had the pleasure of meeting. 
Uh, I'm the senior planner here at the township and uh, also reside here in the township with my, uh, my wife and my two sons. And uh, the first application to be heard this morning is zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 3422 in the name of Lang. And this property is located at 1017 Fife Avenue in the community of Windermere. And uh, I would direct committee's attention to the consent sketch on page 20 of today's agenda package. Uh, the purpose and effect of the application is to permit zoning exemptions to facilitate the construction of an oversized accessory secondary dwelling unit. And, um, and the property is located within the unserviced community of Windermere and within the community residential R3 zone. In cases where properties in the R3 zone have shoreline frontage, a secondary dwelling unit is not a uh, permitted accessory use and therefore an exemption to the permitted accessory uses is requested to permit the secondary dwelling. Uh, the, um, so on shoreline lots outside of urban centers, only two buildings are permitted to contain habitable space, those being a dwelling and a uh, sleeping cabin. Uh, so um, in this case, as the proposed secondary dwelling would constitute a third building containing habitable space, an exemption is requested. And please note that this exemption was inadvertently not included in the public notice and staff have therefore recommended a minor amendment to the draft bylaw to include it. Uh, the zoning bylaw establishes a maximum gross floor area of 1,195 square feet for a secondary dwelling unit. In this case, a floor area of 1,865 square feet is proposed and an exemption is therefore requested. In the community designation, the maximum permitted accessory building height is 20 feet. In this case, the proposed height of the secondary dwelling is intended to be 27 feet and therefore an exemption is also requested. Notice of this public meeting was circulated 21 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act and three submissions have been received to date. Uh, the Township's Development Services Division and Public Works Department have advised they have no concerns and the District of Muskoka has submitted a letter um, and from that in that letter the recommendation reads um, district staff would not be opposed to the approval of the application provided that appropriate development control techniques are used to conserve areas of coniferous vegetation so in regards to these comments i would just like to note that the intent of preserving coniferous vegetation is to protect a deer wintering habitat in this case the proposed secondary dwelling unit is intended to generally use a previously um, or a previous development envelope and uh, only very minimal vegetation removal is anticipated. Uh, there have not been any comments submitted uh, for this application by members of the public, and I have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration, and staff have recommended approval of the application subject to a minor amendment uh, to include the exemption permitting the secondary, secondary dwelling unit to be a third habitable building on the property and I have no further comments at this time. I would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Soya. And uh, the applicant agents today, I believe, is that uh, Mr. Fawner? Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, hopefully everyone uh, can hear me. Uh, it's uh, Steve Fawner, uh, Northern Vision Planning Limited, 109 Meta Heights Drive, Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L1A4. And I'm here representing uh, Don and Karen Lang, uh, owners of the property on uh, um, Patton Point in uh, Windermere. Uh, also present uh, today, if, if needed, uh, is uh, Bridget Shim and uh, Narsi uh, Nagahani, as well as uh, I noticed that uh, Jack and Wayne Judges are here too, and they're, they're the contractors on this uh, particular project. So they'll be here to potentially answer any questions. Uh, first, I'd like to thank staff for their uh, positive report. Uh, the actual circulation was amended uh, a bit from what was originally uh, circulated, but we have no uh, objection to that. We had applied for a second dwelling on the property, and I'll make comment uh, on that uh, further. I do have a PowerPoint presentation if uh, that could be put up, and I'll uh, get through that within my five-minute time frame. Right? So if you could proceed on to the next uh, slide. 
So again, as I just uh, mentioned, uh, this was originally submitted as a second dwelling on the lot. I think staff is a little bit more comfortable calling it a secondary dwelling. The property in this case is quite large. It's divisible. It could be divided into five lots actually uh, under the current zoning bylaw provision. So it is divisible and to be honest with you, that's why I did apply for it as a second dwelling. I did want to note that uh, there's a little bit of a slight conflict in the staff report. Uh, it's been mentioned both there was a single story and a two story boathouse to be constructed. There was a pre existing two story boathouse, and that's been removed. And the proposal is for a single story boathouse. So the property does have, and the owner has the right to have two habitable buildings on land currently. Next. This is the overall site plan of the property and, and just to locate the uh, main dwelling that's currently under construction is at the point or the west end of the property. And the uh, uh, proposed uh, secondary dwelling is uh, towards the middle of the uh, drawing there. Next. And this is just showing a close up uh, and showing the uh, proposed uh, setbacks and I'll touch on those. Uh, these setbacks are greatly enhanced from what's normally required. Next. These are just a, a couple of uh, elevation drawings, um, one showing the entrance uh, to the garage, which uh, this is the west elevation, so it would be from the west. The one at the bottom is the south elevation. This is what would be seen from the lake side. I will point out that the property falls off both to the left here, which would be to the west and to the point, but also falls off uh, to the foreground of, of this particular uh, elevation drawing as well. Next. So in terms of the site itself, this is taken uh, looking at the point with the um, dwelling under construction. This was taken in June of this year. So certainly I'm sure the dwelling is much further along than what's shown here. Next. And this is uh, getting closer to the uh, proposed area of the proposed uh, secondary dwelling. So it has an excellent shoreline buffer. Next. This is probably the worst case photo. There's a little bit of a cut there, and I think this may have been to uh, gain view from a previous dwelling or farmhouse that was on the property, but it's it's all actually growing in by itself right now. But this is the only little cut in the shoreline vegetative buffer throughout uh, this portion of the frontage of the lot. Next. So this is the site itself, uh, again, taken in June with uh, heavy foliage on the property. Next. And this would be looking out uh, towards the lake at that location. Next. And this is just to show you some remnants of an old, uh, the old foundation that was there uh, and where the old uh, farmhouse was. Next. And this is just showing some steps um, that uh, still are there, of course. And this was a, a portion of the old uh, farmhouse. And we're going to be very close to this location. Next. And this is a shoreline buffer uh, in front, and you can see the, some of the new growth uh, in that very, very small cut area. Next. So just, uh, I'll go through it uh, very quickly here. Village Windermere is considered a settlement area and, and the high level documents um, basically direct development to these settlement areas. Next. And um, basically the subject property is quite large, as I indicated, it's over a thousand feet of frontage around the shoreline and six and a half acres. And the size of this proposed dwelling is very modest uh, in comparison to others. Next. The minimum front yard setback is 66 feet. We're proposing 163. And the minimum side yard setback in an R3 zone, which is what this is in Windermere is six feet. We're proposing 62 feet for a side yard setback. Next. And I mentioned the shoreline buffer, I mentioned the property is uh, divisible. Um, we're only at a lot coverage of, we're going to be less than 7%, whereas in an R3 zone, 20% is permitted as the lot coverage. If anyone were to look at the um, site plan very closely, you'll see an old plan that was underlain of that many, many years ago that actually showed 15 lots on this property. Next. And separation of the dwellings would be 225 to 250 feet apart. So lots of room for a potential severance if that were ever to occur in the future. Next. Just wanted to say that the original proposal, I guess I've mentioned already was for a second dwelling. I guess what would have happened in that case if it was circulated as a second dwelling, there would be no exemption for the height requirement because you're allowed to go 35 feet for the dwelling. I just wanted to note at the bottom there that if these were separate lots, you could have 7,500 square feet of habitable space in each dwelling on each lot. 
So we're, we're really, this uh, proposal is only for a dwelling of 1,865 square feet. Next. So conclusions, I, I'm, I'm just going to repeat myself, so I'll just uh, be very quick, but I think the main thing is the property is quite large, it's divisible. Next. And just to, to point out that, um, you know, again, it's very modest in size and again, it's well set back. So anyways, I'm here to answer any questions and I hope that uh, planning committee can uh, see through to an approval today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Farner. Um, is there anybody from the public who wish to speak uh, in support of this application? None? Are there, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak against this application? All right, if there are none, are there, do the committee have any questions that they would like to ask? Emma, uh, uh, Councillor Burry. Uh, thank you, and uh, through you to uh, to Stephen. Um, uh, uh, five lots, uh, I think, uh, um, may maybe three lots uh divisible would be would be uh, my understanding and, and i'm wondering when uh you know the the lake shore uh length uh creeped into our lexicon <clears throat> when it used to be you know the uh, a, a straight line uh for frontage so uh, you know i i'm going to say i'm generally in favor of, of this um and i think it is a very large property my 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 concern is around setting a precedent of two dwellings on a single property. And um, I'm, I'm wondering if your clients, I've embedded a couple of questions in here, if your clients might be, uh, uh, um, if they'd consider uh, limiting the, uh, the future severance, uh, given that I'm not concerned about the current residents, but precedent in this township is, uh, is pretty prevalent. And, um, you know, the two dwellings, you start to sever it and then we know where it goes. So I'll leave that to, to you, Stephen. Okay, thank you. And uh, and through the chair, uh, in response, I guess, uh, a couple of things. When, when you do uh, severances, you can, when you lay out lots, you can actually take advantage of the shoreline around the property as opposed to the straight line frontage. And I won't go into a lot of detail because I'd have to illustrate it, but um, you can take advantage of that shoreline when doing severances. Um, this could support five lots, but I think uh, I think the bottom line is really, if you can divide it in two, for example, you could have two dwellings and two sleeping cabins on this property. So I think that's really the bottom line is it can be divided at least into two. Um, in terms of uh, uh, precedent, there have been other approvals uh, that I'm aware of, but I do I do go back a long ways with the township. So uh, I do have a fairly long memory, but I do know that there have been other cases where a second dwelling has been permitted where a property is divisible. Um, they could come back and draw the line around this and, and create the lot, but that creates additional expenses. Um, surveyors right now, quite frankly, um, I deal with John Hiley mostly, and uh, he's totally backed up. He wouldn't be able to survey this uh, for almost another year. Uh, so there's a timing issue. We have a contractor who's on the property right now uh, who's able to do this. So um, anyways, I, I feel it's a reasonable application and, and uh, um, there have been other previous approvals that have been for uh, a second dwelling on the property where it is divisible. That's the key thing. Thank you. Uh, by, am I live? Yes, you are. So, so chair, you, through you, of course, but you were muted there, so I couldn't hear uh, you, but I could see your lips moving there. Thank you for that. Uh, um, I guess I would ask uh, our, our good friend, uh, Mr. Burry, that question he asked of Stephen, could we ask that of staff? I'd ask staff to uh, weigh in on this. I mean, of course, the RECO, um, from staff is to approve this. So I'd, I'd like that same sensitivity from our people as from uh, the paid folks. Uh, so is that David or I'll leave that Bryce? There you go, thank you. Mr. Sharp. Through you, Chair Bosenworth. Uh, 
Councillor Zavitz, uh, thank you for your question. I would concur with uh, Mr. Fawner that in this case, staff have weighed heavily on the fact that the property is divisible and therefore we've supported the application. I think it's important to note that a lot, uh, you know, an additional, at least one additional lot, likely more could be created each, uh, developed with their own dwelling, sleeping cabin, shoreline structures, septic systems, driveways, et cetera. So uh, relative to that, uh, as compared to what is proposed, uh, staff can lend their support uh, for the application. Happy to elaborate if needed, thank you. We've just lost the chair for a moment. Can you just bear with us when we get, uh, we're working on a technical difficulty. Okay. All right, I'm back. Uh, um, just uh, Mr. Fawner, I wonder if you, or sorry, uh, Mr. Sharp, I wonder if you could uh, Tell us whether you thought this could be uh, five lots, as Mr. Fawner had mentioned. Thank you, Chair Bosomworth. As Mr. Fawner had noted, it can be difficult to explain without uh, illustrating or scaling off <clears throat> the actual extent of the straight line frontage uh, that could be applied to individual lots in this scenario, but the property does form a peninsula lot uh, with you know, frontage on two sides uh, plus over the point. So in these cases, um, the, the, the zoning bylaw as it stands today would require uh, 200 feet of straight line frontage and one acre uh, per lot. The property I believe has over six acres of lot area and over a thousand feet of assessed Frontage, so I can I think you know definitely more than two lots could be created, but uh, I would have to review a survey closely to ascertain exactly how many lots uh, could be uh, created from the parcel as it exists today. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Uh, next, uh, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you, and through you, it's, I'm just picking up on the same uh, thread of questioning here, and I just want a clarification from our staff on something that Mr. Fawner said about the uh, straight line frontage versus the assessed frontage, and that um, and that uh, it is typically used when we're going through a consent application, it, or it's not uncommon to be using. And I just wanted a clarification from staff the straight line frontage or the assessed frontage? Through you, Chair Bosenworth, happy to answer that question. It's a good, good question. There is a distinction. Um, in this case, the assessed frontage is ultimately what the owner is paying taxes on. So in other words, it's, it's essentially the sinuous frontage or the entire lake frontage. Um, straight line frontage is specifically essentially a figment of the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw. It's how the zoning bylaw requires frontage to be measured. And it's largely due to, um, A, just to make things uh, a little more simpler, I think, uh, for ourselves and the review of planning applications, but also it's largely related to how we um, control and regulate shoreline structures in the township, shoreline structures, uh, the width of shoreline structures are permitted to be a, cer a certain percentage of a property's uh, straight line frontage. And my understanding is, is that in the mid-2000s, uh, there was a, a, a large exercise that's referred to as the waterfront density exercise, where um, the width of shoreline structures was determined through that process. And it was all based on straight line frontage, largely because when you're, you know, 300 feet offshore, um, of a property, you know, that straight line frontage uh, is, is a better indication or um, from a visual perspective than the frontage of, a, than, than say the assessed frontage where you might have a, 
you know, a small indentation in the shoreline that's not visible from 300 feet offshore. I think a straight line frontage is more uh, uh, indicative of, of, you know, the extent of a property's frontage as it may be uh, viewed from the lake. Happy to provide any uh, further information if, if necessary. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharp. Um, uh, in, insight that I was not aware of. Uh, next, uh, Councillor Moyer Kent. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a quick question, really, You're for muted. staff. I just unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I think that was my fault. Thanks. Sorry. Okay, quick question for staff. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, if we were, if if it was required to sever the property into two to build the second dwelling, what would be the fees and expenses associated with that that would have be been earned by the township and or a cost to the uh, landowner? Mr. Sharp. Through you, Chair Bosenworth, thank you, Councillor Moyer Kent, for your question. There would be an application fee that would be uh, required. Um, How much is that? It'd be uh, $1,600 for the application fee, and then there would yeah. be a, uh, an additional $400 fee. Uh, what could the, the fee could be more depending on um, the number of lots that's being created, but if it's just one new lot, there'd be a, a $400 what we would refer to as a septic inspection fee that's taken as part of any uh, complete application. And uh, using that fee, um, the, a, a township uh, building inspector visits the property to make sure that there's no issues with respect to uh, existing or proposed servicing. So it's essentially just to confirm that the, the new newly created lot can be appropriately uh, serviced. Um, in addition to that, there may be, uh, you know, studies that would be required by staff as part of a complete application that the applicant would need to uh, pay for out of, out of pocket. And there would also be a, uh, generally speaking, there's a, a required condition for new lot creation where a new vacant lot is being created. Uh, there's a, a fee for what we refer to as cash in lieu of parkland. So under the Planning Act, when a new lot is created, um, the municipality has the option either to um, require parkland as part of that process, and that's typically done for much larger um, lot creation proposals, typically for plans of subdivision relative to single lot creation. For single lot creation, it's typically cash in lieu of parkland, and it's um, taken based on um, a town a policy that the township has with respect to the amount that is required. So it essentially it's 5% of the assessed value of the entire lands or the newly created vacant lot, whichever is, um, whichever is less. So, um, you know, there would be that as well um, that would be required and the, the applicant would need to pay those monies as well. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, Council? Just, just, yeah, one question. Does the, the cash in lieu of parkland, that's real cash that would go to the township? Yes, um, okay. that is cash that goes to the township. It gets put into a reserve fund and it's used to maintain um, the township's existing parkland facilities or develop new ones um, over time. And, and you know the intent of this is um, ultimately when there's new lots created, there's um, uh, it, it introduces a demand for those types of municipal facilities, and hence um, the money is put into that reserve fund to assist with that. Thank you. Councillor Zavitz. Uh, thank you, through you. Uh, I guess a rather esoteric uh, high-level question perhaps to staff. Um, does the OLT uh, co uh, contemplate the township's concern for, um, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, our, our concern that we're, we would be making an exception here, to, again, to Councillor Burry's earlier thought, is that something we can stand on? 
do they uh, allow us to go to OLT and say, well, this, you know, we don't want to set a precedent here. Uh, does that matter to them? Is that a point for us, I guess, is a question? I see Director Pink um, has come on this on the screen. Uh, perhaps you can answer that, Director Pink. Thank you, uh, through you. I think it's important to note that the application is not for two dwellings on a property, although somewhat appears that way. This property is in a community where we allow a secondary dwelling, and really the application is to allow uh, a larger secondary dwelling. I think it certainly would come into play if this was a waterfront residential property and an owner with a large divisible lot was looking to add a second dwelling because the policies really look for one dwelling per lot. And I think it would be correct to direct them to the severance process uh, in order to subdivide and then build accordingly. But this is uh, fairly unique. It's in the community of Windermere. We do allow secondary dwellings and technically the application is for larger. I think we're somewhat supporting the oversize based on what could largely be done. So I think it seems like a committee, I get the impression that is generally supportive of it, perhaps a bit hung up on process, but I think uh, uh, I think it is a reasonable request for those reasons that we've we discussed. And I hope that helps answer the question, Councillor Evans. I see Councillor Nishikawa has uh, joined the committee. Welcome. And uh, you have a question, Councillor Nishikawa. I've been on since 8.30, so. I didn't just join. Um, I, I want to point out that this is a, um, really we are just looking at from 1100 square feet of what we would allow to to, to the number that they're, sorry, I, I misplaced it, but it, you know, 1300 square feet. This is a very um, common application. And I, I think we're getting hung up on a waterfront discussion when it's, it, that's not what it is. And we actually wanted these types of applications to come forward that in, in fact would encourage additional housing uh, in our municipality. I would ask if we could actually read the question and then uh, move forward with whatever other comments or, or questions people have, because I, I feel that, um, the process is, is becoming very long because we're trying to go through an education process as well. But I have to respect that the applicants have their architects and, and other staff members on the call that we should make a deci decision and then move on with the education at a, a later date. Thank you, uh, Councilor Nishikawa. Well, let me just ask if there are any more questions because if there are no more questions, we can move on. I see none, so let me read the resolution. Be it resolved that planning committee re recommends to Township Council that the zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA-34-2 Lang roll number 3-2-015 be approved subject to a minor amendment to bylaw 2022-139 for an exemption from section 3.4.5 of the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw to permit an accessory secondary dwelling unit on a lot where only a dwelling and sleeping cabin are permitted. All those in favor? Uh, anyone opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Our second application today is zoning bylaws. Here, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just pointing out that um, there was a hand up by the um, the builders, and I'm wondering if you know. I did not see that. Thank you very much. Um, clerk, do we let the builders have something to say? We uh, I'll give you the, are the, the builders still there and would they, would they like anything to say? There we are. Uh, go ahead, please. Guy, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for, uh, for their patience and for, uh, for what they've done. You've done a good thing here. Uh, these people, the Langs are, uh, are all for keeping Muskoka 
uh, good um, uh, compared to some of the other crazy stuff that goes on. So you've, you've made a good decision uh, for sure. They're lovely people. They really are. Been in Muskoka all their lives. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for pointing that out, uh, Councilor Nishikawa. So I think with, um, I read, I think I introduced this, right? So um, we, and this is Mr. Sawyer. So if you could uh, go ahead, Mr. Sawyer, thank you. Thank you, Chair Bozemorth. Uh, the next application to be heard is Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application ZBA 3622 in the name of uh, 3007 Muskoka Road 169 Bala Limited. The property is located at 3007 Muskoka Road 169 within the urban center of Bala. And I would direct committee's attention to the sketches starting on page 101 of today's agenda package. The subject property is located within the urban center of Bala and it contains two main buildings. The most westerly of the two buildings contains a hardware store in the first story and two residential apartment units in the second story. And the most easterly building contains three apartment units in the second story and there are three commercial units on the first story. This property is in the highway commercial C4 zone where residential and retail uses are typically not permitted. However, two existing site-specific bylaws, which were approved in 1986 and 1989, permit these five existing residential units and the retail store. Uh, the purpose and effect of the application is to recognize these existing residential and retail uses within the new, the new bylaw and then to repeal these historic bylaws. It is also the purpose of the application to permit the conversion of the three commercial units, which are located on the first story of the Easterly building. Uh, these are currently not occupied and um, the owner intends to convert them into six additional apartment units. Since residential and retail are not permitted uses in the C4 zone, an exemption is requested to specifically permit the existing and proposed uses. Uh, more specifically, the bylaw would permit a residential multiple dwelling use as a main use in the first story and second story of the Easterly building, and also within the second story of the build of building number two or the, sorry, the uh, Westerly building. And then to also permit a retail store as a main use in the first story of uh, the Easterly building, uh, which is the hardware store. Uh, notice of this public meeting was circulated 21 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act and four submissions have been received to date, all of which have been provided to committee in advance of today's meeting. Uh, the District of Muskoka, the Township's uh, uh, Development Services Division, and the Public Works Department have advised they have no objections. There has been one comment received from, member, from a member of the public. The submission, which um, has been forwarded to committee, was received from Tiffany Birch, owner of the abutting property to the south, located at 1018 Windsor Drive. And uh, Ms. Birch has raised concerns um, which include a concern with snow removal and the runoff onto this abutting property as a result of piled snow due to plowing. Um, also solid waste removal on the property has been identified as a concern and the uh, letter questions how the additional waste generated from additional residential units will be managed. And also trespassing has been raised as a concern as there's been instances of people trespassing um, across uh, the property to uh, in order to reach Long Lake. And staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration and have recommended approval of the application subject to receiving comments from the District of Muskoka uh, with regards to municipal water and sewer services and also a few minor amendments to the draft site-specific bylaw. Uh, so since the staff, since the time the staff report was written, the District of Muskoka has now submitted comments and uh, has um, indicated that they have no concerns um, with regards to water and sewer services. And uh, the recommended minor amendments to the bylaw include um, a restriction on the number of apartment dwellings to a maximum of 11, uh, as this proposal involves, and uh, requiring minimum floor areas for apartment dwelling units. So where apartment style dwellings are permitted elsewhere in the township, minimum unit sizes apply. In this case, the existing units um, and, 
and the proposed units exceed this minimum. However, staff feel that the same standards should apply to the units on the property and have therefore recommended that uh, they be added, um, which would prohibit future interior alterations that might decrease unit sizes. Uh, the floor, um, sorry, uh, staff have also recommended a minor amendment to rezone a small portion of the property. The zone mapping schedules show that the southernmost portion of the property um, is within the community residential waterfront zone. This section of the property does not front on a water body and it appears that this is a mapping error that originated in 2001 when the subject property was severed from the property to the south. Uh, this abutting property to the south is zoned R4 and um, does, does front onto Long Lake and it appears that the zone boundary at the time of the severance was not captured correctly to follow the lot line and therefore staff recommended that this area be, re I've recommended that this area be rezoned from R4 to C4 to match the remainder of the commercial property. And uh, I have no further comments at this time, but would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sawyer. Uh, is the applicant or their agent here and willing to speak? Uh, Mr. Sherbach? Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Stefan Sherbach from Planscape Inc., 104 Kimberly Avenue in Bracebridge. Uh, first of all, congratulations, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, and the uh, rest of council um, for your, your seats. We're really looking forward to the, the planners at Planscape. We're looking forward to working with you in the next exciting four-year term. Um, I'm here today to uh, speak on behalf of the owners of the subject property, um, represented by Mr. Jim Broham, and many of you may know him from Mizanga Building Group North in uh, Port Carling. He is here um, and uh, at the meeting and ready to jump in in case I can't answer any questions from the committee. As Mr. Sawyer correctly noted, the application in front of the committee is really one attempt to tackle the shortage in rental and attainable housing in Muskoka. The property contains two separate buildings. Uh, there's five legally existing apartments in, in uh, collectively in the, on the property. And the applicants essentially intend to renovate the larger building that's currently underutilized with vacant commercial space on the ground floor. There are no proposed changes to the smaller building and uh, it already contains a successful commercial use being uh, Pangeli's hardware store. The application will seek uh, to expand the residential apartment use on the lower level of the larger of the two buildings. Uh, thanks again to staff uh, for their assistance and suggested revisions to ensure this application is fully supported by the applicable policies within your official plan. I have carefully read the staff report and fully support their complete policy review. I agree with the recommendations in front of the committee, including those three minor amendments uh, in front of you. They make sense to ensure the proposal is clear, uh, specifically with this um, site-specific amendment. Um, as uh, Mr. Sawyer properly noted, uh, noted, the property is within the community and urban service limits of Bala. There's one really key policy that applies across your municipality, and I just wanted to reiterate that, and that's policy C.11.1.4. And that's where, and I quote, every effort will be made to encourage the development of affordable housing, end quote. Um, it is... Uh, it, designed uh, and, and designated to continue to be zoned to permit a highway commercial use. And uh, this also provides some flexibility if for whatever reason the rental market decreases, the lower levels could essentially be turned back into some type of uh, smaller scale retail type uses. So it does provide that flexibility at this time. Um, Mr. Chair, I acknowledge the correspondence received from the abutting neighbor, and I would note that the owners will ensure that these um, any of these concerns are, are addressed appropriately, uh, specifically related to snow storage garbage locations. Um, this essentially will be done through regular property management on the property. Any issues related to fencing or trespass, uh, again, are civil matters. Um, knowing that the owners are uh, local, they intend to ensure that any of these complaints are addressed immediately, and they're here and uh, also you know, very concerned uh, about ensuring this property fits into the community of Bala. 
They're invested in the community. The, the owners are invested in the community. And clearly this is evident by the, uh, you know, the building group buying this property specifically at this time to be used to house uh, many of their employees, um, which clearly is a shortage in the area. Um, finally, Mr. Chair, I, I agree with staff. The application fully conforms to the intent of your official plan and the district's official plan. It complies with the zoning bylaw provisions and represents good planning. And I'm available for any questions that you have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sherback. I will welcome Councillor McIntyre. I think you've just joined recently. Um, and uh, is there anybody who would like to speak in favor and support of this application? Uh, they are on their way in. We're just waiting for the uh, technology to catch up. Um, I am told that you are now in the, uh, is it Tiffany? Tiffany? Tiffany, please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, also thank you to Stefan for addressing some of the issues and the um, working nature with the owners of the property with regards to the concerns that um, may be future issues. I, I greatly Tiffany, appreciate could, that. Could I have your uh, name and address, please, for the records? Dry. Go ahead, Tiffany, but with your, and if you could start with your name and address first, please. Uh, Tiffany Birch, 1018 Windsor Drive, a property within proximity to the uh, applicants today. Uh, I just want to uh, thank Stefan for uh, addressing the potential issues that could be when we're increasing uh, living residential units, uh, essentially going from uh, the current five and adding another six to the total of 11 uh, with the issues with regards to additional snow loads that might be uh, placed on the property in specific areas, uh, garbage and so forth. So I appreciate that and uh, hope to have a, a good working relationship with the uh, property owner. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else uh, who uh, wish to speak in support or against uh, this application? Uh, seeing none, I will turn it over to Council for questions. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Uh, through you to, I, I'm actually, my question is going to be uh, through to David, I think. Um, first of all, I just wanted to let uh, folks know that may not know this area. This building has unsuccessfully, for the last 25 years that I'm aware of, not been able to run any commercial businesses other than the hardware store. The hardware store has been fantastic. We never can lose that hardware store. Um, but there's been many, many businesses that have tried to operate, either a cafe, uh, gift shops, those types of things, and they just haven't been successful. And the interesting thing, we don't include this property in our community improvement plan. I'm very excited that this is uh, becoming residential. And in fact, uh, the previous owner did bring this forward many years ago um, and, then, and then essentially gave up. Sorry, someone else's phone. Um, I, I guess my question would be, it is there a possibility to, in the future, to review the minimum size of the, um, the units? Like, I, I feel like some of those numbers are old now compared to what people are um, willing to live in, if I was to put it that way. And it may not apply to this particular building, but other future buildings. But I, I am concerned that we may be using an old standard for um, accommodation sizes. Um, so I, I don't know, David, if that's something that we can look at. 
Um, but as I said, I'm very excited about this particular application and, um, and the ability to have uh, housing there because in fact, um, it's needed and it's actually an ideal location in my opinion. Uh, thank you, Nish, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. I will let David give a brief answer on that, but as you pointed out in the previous one, this is somewhat education. Thank you, uh, through you, the chair. Um, the, the minimum uh, square footages are, are quite low, but uh, you're right, they may be able to be slightly lower. Uh, what staff is happy to do if council or committee is supportive and recommends approval to council. Uh, in those next 30 days, we can confirm with uh, building staff what the minimum Ontario building code requirements are and bring those forward in the in the amended bylaw to council in January if uh, that's the wish of committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Zavitz. Uh, thank you, through you. I'm, I, as a Ward 8 councillor, am also very excited uh, I'm pleased, and, and this is most necessary. So I'm certainly in, in total support of, uh, of this uh, proposal. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, let me read the resolution. Be it resolved that planning committee recommends to Township Council Zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 36 32 3007 Muskoka Road 169 Bala, limited roll number 7 4 3031 02, be approved subject to comments from the District of Muskoka with regards to municipal water. Can we take that part out because we've already received the? Uh, All right, we have um, removed the reference to uh, waiting for comments from the District of Muskoka, and we have uh, changed the requirements of the minimum floor size. This is a recommendation to Council, obviously, uh, to uh, make them as specified by the Ontario Building Code rather than this section of our bylaw. Uh, did everybody, I think that's what everybody wanted. Could I just have a general uh, straw poll of that, that, that people are agreed with that? Thank you very much. All right, now let me read the, uh, the uh, resolution. Be it resolved that planning committee recommends to Township Council that zoning bylaw amendment application ZB 36 slash 223007 Muskoka Road 169 Bala Limited, roll number 7-4-031-02 be approved subject to minor amendments to bylaw 2022-142 as follows. Restrict the number of apartment dwelling units to a maximum of 11. Require minimum floor areas for apartment dwelling units as specified in the Ontario Building Code. Rezone the portion of the subject property zone community residential waterfront R4 <clears throat> to community commercial highway C4. Oh. Thank you. And that was moved by Councillor Edwards. 
Thank you. That was moved by Councillor Roberts and seconded by Councillor McIntyre. All those in favor? Uh, all those opposed? Carried, thank you. It being a little after 10, is everybody in favor of a 12 minute break, eight minute, 15 minute break? Yep. All right. We will return at, do the math for me, about 20 after.
Councillor Roberts, your yellow hand is up. Yes, it is, Chair. I just uh, would like to relay, to relay to you that Councillor Edwards had a power outage and he is trying to get back on. Uh, hopefully he is on. I can't see the full score on screen. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Our uh, next zoning bylaw application is zoning bylaw 37 slash 22 bylaw 2022-143. That is Ms. Crowder. Thank you, Chair Bosenworth, and good morning, members of committee. The next application to be heard is zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 3722ML bylaw 2022-143 in the name of Castellarin. The subject property is known municipally as 1133 Innisfree Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted zoning sketch on page 140 of the agenda package. The purpose of zoning bylaw 2022-143 is to provide an exemption from the minimum required front yard setback for a sport court. The minimum permitted setback is 200 feet and the requested setback is 67 feet at the closest point from the high water mark. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 24 days in advance and five submissions have been received to date. The following comments were received and have been circulated to committee prior to today's meeting. Comments have been received from Nick Snyder, the township's chief building official, stating that review of the septic system records indicate that an imported mantle area was required down slope of the existing leaching bed area. A minimum of 15 meters, approximately 50 feet, of undeveloped area is required down slope of the leaching bed area to ensure sufficient treatment of effluent. The proposed location of the sports court does not achieve these requirements. Comments have been received from Tim Sofko, the township's public works technician, stating that they have no objection to the application. Comments have been received from the district municipality of Muskoka, stating that they have no objection to the application. A letter of objection was received from the Acton, sorry, Acton Island Association, which can be summarized as follows. The Acton Island Association represents some 120 families that own property on Acton Island. They have stated that the proposal reduces the required setback by 67%. The current bylaw requirement of 200 feet is intended to provide sufficient setback to reduce nuisance from noise and evening lighting and to ensure that the shoreline buffer is protected. This proposal provides no assurance that any of the, those objectives will be met. Further, the, with the loss of site plan control under Bill 23, the Acton Island Association is very concerned that implementation may not be in keeping with best practices and requests that committee make a determination which reflects the principles set out in the bylaws and the official plan. A second letter of objection was received from Amy Scott on behalf of the Scott family, adjacent property owners, stating that they are opposed to the proposed amendment as it would set an unwanted precedent of development alongside the water's edge. They further state that the proposal would require tree removal and paving which would disrupt the natural environment and drainage of the area and would also greatly impact the views and natural environment surrounding their own property. Staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. Staff have recommended that the application be denied. Should committee be considering approval of the application without the authority to impose site plan control, consideration could be given to a deferral or withholding third reading until revegetation of the front yard is complete a lighting plan and stormwater management brief complete with a stormwater management grading plan prepared by a professional engineer are completed, a silt fence is in place and properly installed, and any necessary tree conservation and or site alteration permits are obtained. The agent for this application reached out to planning staff before the meeting to advise that they will be requesting that committee defer the application to allow their client to consider a revised proposal for a reduced size and reorientation of the sports court. I believe Steve is here today who can speak more to that. I have no further comments at this time, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Crowder. Um, Madam Clerk, I guess it's appropriate for Mr. Fawner to have his time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fawner, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, again, Chair uh, Bosworth, uh, members of the uh, committee, um, Stephen Fawner, Northern Vision Planning Limited, 109 Meadow Heights Drive, Race Bridge, Ontario, P1L1A4. Um, <clears throat> I'm here representing uh, Marianne and Michael Castellaren uh, regarding this particular uh, application. Uh, I would like to go through and just point out certain matters in support of the application as is, but also say that we're looking at uh, uh, a deferral and uh, to sort of reorient the uh, the proposed sport court and actually reduce it uh, significantly in size to really something uh, more along the lines of a, a pickleball court, which is considerably smaller. So um, anyways, if I could have my uh, PowerPoint presentation come up, that'd be great. Thank you. If we could just go to the next slide there, Alex. Thank you. Yes. Um, just uh, in this, I think you're you're aware through the reading of the notice um, uh, by Emily what the proposal is. I would note that the median setback is 92 feet. Uh, and in fact, at the east end of the proposed court, it actually is 120 feet back from the uh, uh, shoreline. It's just a matter of the shoreline in this property does dip in considerably at the middle portion of the property. And that's why we have a uh, the minimum front yard setback is is fairly close. Uh, the proposed sport court was to be 55 feet by 115, which is a slightly undersized uh, tennis court. It's uh, not quite full size, but it's close to it. Next. So this is the uh, proposed uh, tennis court you can see there. I just want to make note here of the original driveway that is sort of going underneath, if you will, the proposed court. That was one of the only reasons why I supported the application to begin with, because obviously the setbacks don't uh, match what's in the bylaw or, or not close to it. But there's been pre-existing tree removal of almost half of the area. Uh, that's already taken place, but we are looking to reorient this uh, considerably. So uh, um, anyways, I'll talk about that in a moment. Next. So this is the existing entrance into the property, into the existing uh, garage and uh, dwelling. Next. This is the old entrance uh, from Industry Road, um, and it's, it's still quite evident on the property, and obviously there have been tree removal in the past. Next. This uh, is down towards the waterfront at the east uh, end of the proposed uh, court. You can see a considerable open area. I'm going to come back to this photo later and just to talk about how we're going to reorient that, but the, uh, the proposal that was submitted would actually run uh, where I'm standing uh, towards the lot line and then back behind me. <clears throat> Next. This is the uh, uh, shoreline buffer at the one of the closest points. Next. And this is the shoreline buffer, which is approximately 120 feet away in this uh, particular location. Next. And this is a, a summer photo uh, that was provided by the uh, the applicant and shows a significant uh, shoreline buffer area uh, to the uh, left, or that would be to the uh, south, we'll say more or less, or southeast of the uh, dwelling. Uh, the dwelling is somewhat open. My client has indicated that they would be amenable to some plantings there um, if they were to obtain approval. Next. So I'll, I'll just uh, skip through this uh, part next. And uh, just uh, pointing out the OP talks about the importance of front yard setbacks, which I'm well aware of. Next. There is an excellent shoreline buffer in place on the property as seen. We did provide a very brief uh, memo from Beacon Environmental. Uh, I know it was very short. Uh, we've also had a verbal discussion with Pinestone Engineering regarding stormwater management, and they indicated that yes, it can be mitigated uh, with the current proposal. Next. Uh, I won't go through the official plan criteria. I will. I do want to point out a couple things regarding the background report that staff did for sports courts, and I think it was great that a report was done. Uh, it certainly showed some foresight and that some background was done. However, I think there are a couple of key things that I didn't see were addressed, and that was the uh, adequacy of uh, buffers. Uh, really wasn't uh, addressed as to what's appropriate, whether it be 50 feet, 60 feet, 100 feet. 
And the um, having 200 foot setback as the um, provision for sports courts was really tied to the site alteration bylaw and tree preservation bylaw, but this was never intended to be a prohibitive area. It was intended to be a regulated area. And I know from drafting those bylaws uh, originally in uh, 2008. Uh, next. So again, in, in, in positive points, I guess, the runoff would be no different than a dwelling, although I recognize it is a fair sized surface area. Sport court doesn't have the same building mass uh, and tree removal would only be about half of the court. Next. Um, in terms of staff concerns uh, to address these, um, uh, I mentioned about, you know, in, in our opinion, the runoff can be mitigated. Um, uh, I can certainly uh, approach uh, the municipality as to best uh, implement it. I recognize the changes with Bill 23, uh, but there needs to be some sort of mechanism in place, whether that's applications under your uh, site alteration bylaw, uh, something, but my um, clients are amenable to entering into a site plan agreement. There won't be any lighting of the sport court at all, so that's not an issue. Next. Um, as I mentioned, some revegetation could happen in front of the dwelling. Uh, studies could be completed. And I would note again, the medium, median setback is 92 feet. And there was a previous sport court that was recently approved by Committee of Adjustment in the Windermere area that was uh, 90 some feet back from the water. Next. So in terms of a revised proposal, we're looking at reducing it in size. And there's an uh, 35 feet by 60 feet is, is more than enough to accommodate a pickleball court. And this is, in fact, um, uh, you know, you're only looking at a couple thousand square feet instead of 6,000. So this is reducing it down to a third of what was being proposed. We can orient it in the opposite direction and bring it up beside the uh, septic bed, and then we won't have the concern with the septic runoff as well. Uh, we oriented in that direction, we can certainly attain 100 foot setback and for the most part, uh, the 122 or so feet back from the water. Next. I would also point out that the remaining coverage on the property would permit a 30 by 45 foot building. So and that's really almost what we'd be proposing with a, a pickleball court. Uh, and that would be done 66 feet or could be done 66 feet from the water's edge likely without environmental reports and any stormwater management plan. Next. So just going back to this drawing, if, if you look at the underlying area that's cleared for the driveway, you can see the large area and there's a little square beside it. Uh, we can fit the court uh, from there to the right and then bring it back actually so that we're to the uh, southeast of the uh, septic bed area. And we've got lots of room there. We can slide it back even farther. Uh, and we can attain some pretty reasonable setbacks uh, from that. You can see already that area is 122 feet back, so we can be there even, even slightly more. Next. So this photo back to this area here, that tree is actually located, um, we can orient the court on the other side of that tree that's in the foreground on the left, and we can, instead of oriented it from forward and, and behind where I'm standing, we can do it from left to right and go up the existing driveway. Uh, and it'll be much narrower at that lower end. It'll be 35 feet in width, uh, much narrower than of course the 115 feet that we've proposed. Next. So we are requesting deferral. We would like to look at options. Uh, unfortunately, I've been unable to uh, speak to uh, Jamie Nairn at Beacon um, and I would like to, uh, he hasn't got back to me. Um, but we would like to uh, time to consider some uh, alternatives, which I think we can make uh, some pretty vast improvements to the proposal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fawner. Um, is there I guess we should go through the process of uh, if there's any anybody who would like to speak in favor of this application. And is there anybody who wishes to speak against this application? Michael Lewis. Go with Amy Scott first. All right, uh, Amy Scott, if you could uh, start with your name and address, please. 
Hi everyone, this is Amy and Donna Scott. We are um, the owners of 1135 Innisfree Road, which is the neighboring property. Um, and we just wanna speak out in opposition. I, I appreciate that they're looking to change the plans now from a tennis court to a pickleball court, but that does raise initial concerns for us around noise because pickleball is notoriously a very noisy sport. Um, so on top of our previous concerns around location and proximity to the water, we still have a number of serious concerns around how we would ensure that, you know, is not a noisy sports court setting a precedent. Thank you very much. Um, and the other one is uh, Michael Lewis, I believe. Amy, did you give us your uh, address? I did, yes. It's uh, 1135 Innisfree yeah, Road. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Lewis, if you could come in now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's Michael Lewis, 1583 Acton Island Road, Unit 8. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee for allowing me to speak for a few moments. Um, first of all, let me say thank you to the, uh, the planning staff uh, as we agree with their um, recommendation to deny the existing proposal. And thank you very much for the modification input today uh, through, the, uh, through the presentations. Um, I think probably the best thing to do is cut to the chase on this, and that is um, we're opposed to the amendment as it stands and currently presented today. Um, but the issue is also around not only what's been discussed in terms of not being within the bylaw, it's around the precedent it sets. And the issue becomes then, um, where is this all going for this particular property and many down the road? Uh, the fastest growing sport in North America is pickleball. Um, it is incredibly noisy. It inc is incredibly intrusive on the environment. It is causing uproars in neighborhoods where they're built too close and a lot of restriction. Um, Chair, we have 3,500 residents where I'm sitting right now in Benita Bay. We have 28 tennis courts. We have all kinds of development. The biggest issue this community faces is pickleball and where it will be placed. You can be 150 yards away from pickleball courts and they're noisy and intrusive and they have to be restricted. The bylaw says that this is a sports court if it's a pickleball court. That means it has to be 200 feet back. Secondly, you have to be concerned about your neighbors because every neighbor will go absolutely crazy if pickleballs become rampant on Acton Island and other communities. So with that, I'd ask the committee to be very cautious, very concerning about pickleballs in Muskoka, pickleball courts in Muskoka, and then being intrusive on our environment and intrusive on our neighbors. Uh, we urge you to stop granting exemptions to the bylaw. In this particular case, sports courts are to be 200 feet back and that's it. Thank you for your time. We appreciate all you do. Um, I believe that's all the speakers. Um, let me throw this out to committee. Uh, I think it would be appropriate, given that this is going to be uh, delayed, it should be appropriate if we could give them some guidance about our thoughts. Um, so let me start with uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. As um, I have a, a number of concerns about this particular property. And I'm asking um, staff if they could also look into uh, when this comes back or if it comes back. Um, I would not. Uh, I wouldn't be approving this today uh, at all. Um, but I'm concerned. I'm wanting to have a better understanding of the hard surfaces on this property. It appears there's a lot of paving, like a lot of paving. And in my experience, uh, that water runs fast when it hits pavement. Um, is that something, and I, I'm sorry, I, I should oppose this to, um, to Bryce, I think. No, not Bryce, maybe. I, yeah. Anyhow, um, I, I'm, I'm just very concerned that we have a full picture of, of what the hard services are on this property. Um, I also have concerns that, uh, from, that were presented from the building department, having just recently observed a, um, a new uh, 
septic system going in that was, you know, top of the line and things, but really understanding those, um, it was a great education for me, but, um, you know, and I've put in lots of septic systems, but the challenges today when you have slope lots um, and, and to protect our environment, uh, we have to listen to the staff when it comes to the location of things and and again the runoff from the septic so I really would like to understand more what those hard services are but at this point I, I can't go beyond our bylaw for many of the reasons that the um, the other speakers uh, uh, Mr. Lewis for instance had brought up um, I, I'm also concerned that um, if if an applicant is going to be using for instance, the, the Windermere um, property that, that they used. I would also like to understand what the hard surfaces were on that comparable property, because it's not always the same. Uh, like it's not just, oh, somebody put it in sports court and therefore, what are the other elements on a property? So I almost feel like I need staff to, to be ahead of me or, or know what, what the applicant is going to bring, bring forward because it's very difficult for us to actually look those up and compare during these types of meetings. So at this point, I would not, um, I would not be approving this and I'm not even sure that I'm even acceptable to a deferral uh, only because I don't know that how this is gonna fit in. And I'm certainly not wanting any more hard surfaces on this property from what I can view on the site plan right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nishikawa. Uh, Councillor Zabitz. Uh, thank you, and through you. I, I think along the same lines, um, the word precedent was used at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, you know, it, it, we just got elected again. Uh, there, there would be no appetite to set any sort of a precedent, especially on something like this with a hard surface. Uh, less than that 200 feet. So, I mean, that, that's sort of how I see it. But I do think as the chair has indicated, it's important to, uh, I suppose, send a signal to uh, uh, Mr. Fawner, uh, you know, if you're gonna come back, if we do defer this, uh, give you some guidance. Uh, and, and I think you've heard it from me, at least my personal thought. But, but further to that, as uh, Councilor Nishikawa has indicated, you know, perhaps the best thing to do with this is to turn it down. Um, giving you a deferment may well send the wrong message. And so I'll leave it at that for my peers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zavitz. Uh, Councillor Mazan. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, thank you. And through you, Chair. Um, similar to the previous two comments, I would have a very difficult time approving and or uh, deferring this at this point. I think I need to take the guidance of staff. They've been on site. They've looked at this property. They've indicated some issues around septic and other elements. Um, but the, the, the top uh, part of my decision making here is that in 2020, we passed a bylaw saying that at minimum, uh, we require a 200 foot setback from the high water mark for sports courts. And uh, I think this is a significant departure from that. So uh, at this point, uh, I would be suggesting that we follow staff's lead and deny. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you, um, I, I would like to uh, support a deferral just to give the applicant an, an, a second shot at this. Yes, um, there is a, a lot uh, that we're concerned with, but um, I think that um, given the cost that they would have put into this already, um, a deferral of, of one month, I don't know how that impacts us. Um, I would like to say that uh, the hard surface is a concern and that anything they can do to not put in a hard surface or some sort of material that uh, they can still accomplish what they want, but it provides uh, drainage. Thank you. Thank you to Councillor Roberts. Uh, are there any other comments here? We have two routes ahead of us. One is to 
uh, defer, and I would suggest we should give some guidance to the applicant if we defer, and if we, and then the other option is just to decline this. Uh, any more comments from from uh, committee? Councillor Nishikawa, for your second time. Two things I, I just wanted to ask staff um, through you that a couple things I I noted that I didn't bring this up. I was curious about what that grade was. Um, we saw the picture where Mr. Fawner was taking the picture from, but I want to understand what that grade is and, and if we're allowed to have that information, if this is going to be moved on. But I also want to have uh, staff comment. Um, again, do they feel anywhere that this sports court could fit on this property? Um, I don't see that it could, um, other than like not meeting our bylaw. So I, I just would, I would look to uh, staff for that information. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. I will uh, ask Ms. Crowder if she can give some comments on her opinion on what, on what the slope was. And then I'll ask uh, planning to um, give some uh, uh, answer what uh, Councillor Nishikawa has. Thank you, and through you, Chair Bosomworth. Um, the slope on site um, was somewhat gradual uh, until you approach the shoreline and then it was a bit more steep there. Um, as far as meeting the uh, 200 foot setback for a proposed um, revised proposal, um, the 200 foot setback is almost at the very end of the property. So I don't see how a revised proposal could conform to that, um, but there is potential that a, a revised proposal could be um, a little bit closer to to what the current bylaw requires. Um, hopefully that helps answer without knowing the exact size of a revised sports court. Um, it's a bit hard to say whether I think it could fit or not. Um, I know that other staff in the township did have concerns about the septic and, and the mantle um, setback. So yeah, without specifics, it's a little bit hard to say. Mr. Sharp, can you uh, give your thoughts about uh, the possibility for a revised application? Thank you, Chair Bosomworth. Um, you know, I just a couple things I, I'd like to touch on here is just the notion of precedent. Mr. Fawner has correctly pointed out that there have been a handful of applications that have been approved since um, we, we amended the bylaw to require a, a 200 foot setback. Um, off the top of my head, I think this is the only one um, that's proposing uh, such a deficient uh, setback. So it's only uh, slightly more than what the bylaw um, would have otherwise permitted prior to that change, which was a 66 foot setback from the high water mark. The, one, the other ones that have been approved, some even as minor variances, um, have been set back, I believe, sli only slightly within 100 feet or beyond 100 feet. And of course, you know, each one of these situations has its own unique site specific uh, characteristics that have been evaluated uh, relative to the proposal that was submitted in, in each one of those cases. I think the second um, point that I would just like to make is that I think staff are really st struggling with um, the change that's been brought forward through Bill 23 and how um, we, we might um, look to implement uh, specific mitigation. Um, typically, uh, you know, for these types of applications, staff would look to impose site plan control on the development if it's approved. And through that process, we would require details like um, lighting plans in order to ensure that any exterior flood lighting associated with the sport court would be dark sky compliant. We would require stormwater management plan or a brief at least along with a grading plan to ensure that um, you know the stormwater management associated with existing and proposed buildings is appropriately managed and typically that would be prepared by a and stamped by a professional engineer and all of those documents would form schedules to an agreement that would be registered on title and that would be binding not only on the landowner but on any future landowners and it would be an enforceable document. Um, we currently no longer have that that process. So the reason I'm noting it is if committee is interested in 
deferring this application. Um, you know, I think it would be very helpful for staff uh, to understand um, what committee would require um, as part of that deferral and how those um, requirements would be implemented. So staff have indicated in a report, one option would be, for example, to defer the application for a stormwater management brief um, or plantings. And, you know, would, would we be um, deferring it until those matters are completed and then bring it back? Or would we be withholding third reading until those matters are completed and, and bringing it back for third reading at that time? Those are the the things that I'm thinking and, and that would be helpful for staff to understand if that's the direction that committee's headed. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Moyer-Kent. You have your hand up. Yep. Yep. I was, um, I was only going to uh, comment that my initial read of the file supports Susan's, uh, Councillor Mazan's comments. The lot is just too small. And regardless of where you move it on the property, I think the, the my recommendation would be to deny it rather than go back through a whole nother cycle of trying to fit it into um, a bylaw where they're gonna violate the bylaw regardless. And it's not just a little, the lot is just too short uh, or depth is not wide enough. So anyway, I support Susan's comment that this should be a, uh, defer, not a deferral, a denial at this point in time. Mayor Kelly, if you could comment. Thank you, and through you, uh, just a couple of quick comments, basically to, uh, I think, support what others have said. Uh, I would not be in support of this unless first it was pushed back to within the approved uh, envelope for development. Sounds like the lot's too small to accommodate that. Uh, number two, um, Councilor Nishikawa raised the issue of how much of this real estate is actually already uh, impermeable. And I would, uh, I would really need to see that and understand uh, what more we're adding to the impermeable surface, uh, notwithstanding that the trees may or may not already be partially uh, removed. Um, the additional paving creates all sorts of issues with runoff. I guess the other issue that comes up, and I mean, if we're going to have other uh, requests for pickleball, I don't know anything about pickleball, uh, but from what I'm hearing, it's a loud sport. Uh, and so I think we need to understand, is there any kind of sound mitigation or any way to deaden this? I have no idea whether this is like, you know, throwing sticks of dynamite at each other or if it's something a little more subdued than that. But uh, uh, if it's something that can't be made, um, quiet enough to suit the neighborhood, then we have a bigger issue. Uh, how far back and, and no matter what we do to comply with the sports court, uh, sports court requirements, uh, uh, how can we sort of look the other way and condone something that we, that I understand from what I've heard from certainly Mr. Lewis is going to be uh, uh, detrimental to the neighborhood. So I'd like to, I'd like to understand enough about the opportunity to deaden the sound to, uh, to know that we're not, setting ourselves up for <clears throat> complaints every weekend that somebody's using a court. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kelly. Councillor Zavitz. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, just a quick question for Emily Crowder, our planner. Emily, um, you obviously, uh, in uppercase, are suggesting we, de we deny this. Um, can you ask me, or can you, sorry, can you tell me why, your, what your thinking was around uh, not uh, to suggest that we either deny or defer. You, you simply didn't use the word defer. So can I get a thought on that? Thank you. Absolutely, uh, through you, Chair Bosmworth, and to you, Councillor Zavitz. Um, the proposal from the agent to recommend a smaller sports court came in um, just a few days ago. So when we wrote the report and when we were looking at this proposal, um, it was, with the, with the um, intention of a 6,300 square foot sports court, um, which, you know, based on uh, several points in the discussion, it is just in our uh, planning opinion that that's not um, something that we could support um, due to the reduced setback that's pretty significant from the, um, the bylaw that's in place, the 200 foot uh, setback. 
we also considered um, the impermeable surfaces on the property, um, the storm water that could potentially um, be running off into the into the lake, and um, the sort of lack of control that we would have to implement some of the protective measures um, that would normally um, be available to us through site plan control that is um, no longer the case. So the property is um, at the deepest point, 253 feet um, and, and somewhat significantly less, um, almost 200 feet in depth at the um, closest point. So to accommodate a revised proposal um, wasn't something that we knew the agent and applicant had an appetite for um, until pretty close to the meeting. Um, but yeah, for those reasons, we decided that um, the application should be denied. And um, I would just speak that, as uh, Mr. Sharp pointed out, that we haven't had um, proposals that I'm aware of that um, for, that presented a setback quite this um, reduced from what is permitted. Okay, thank you. Mr. Foner, I think you'd like to say something if you can uh, keep it to the point, please. Yeah, just uh, just on Emily's uh, last point there, I think she's she's read one dimension of lot depth of 253 when however she forgot there's an additional 42 feet on that side. So it's it's actually uh, 295 feet in depth on the easterly side in total. Um, I think there is room to at least be touching on the 200 foot uh, setback. We could look at uh, permeable pavement. There is such a thing uh, that does allow and does mitigate uh, runoff, and that's something we'd, uh, you know, would be certainly interested in exploring. Um, and I think too that I think uh, I may be of assistance uh, to try and uh, assist in terms of how we can implement uh, various uh, um, ways. Uh, the fact that we can't use site plan control the same way we could before. I think there's still other methods, and it's unfortunate that. The province has made a change to uh, Bill 23, and that's holding lots of people at ransom uh, who would normally be using site plan control. And that was one of the cornerstones of your official plan update. And now all of a sudden it's gone. And, you know, with the amount of tree removal with proposals, I'm not sure what you're going to do, but um, I would like to be able to assist with the implementation tools. I think I can be of, of help with that. Thank you. Mr. Sharp, I, if you could uh, comment. Thank you, Chair Bozemuth. Well, I'll keep this uh, quick, but I just uh, I wanted to note there was one specific point that Emily uh, didn't mention in her comments. Um, the application came in as it's been proposed, as it's shown on the site plan. Um, and as part of the process, uh, we circulated internal township departments. And in this case, uh, the township's chief building official provided us with comments. Um, just you know, just prior to us uh, publishing our, our report indicating that the septic system on the property requires an increased area surrounding it where no development can occur. I believe the distance is 50 feet from the leaching uh, bed itself. And that is ultimately in large part, the reason we could not support or recommended that the application be denied. Um, and just more for committee's edification, but of course there are opportunities um, for an application to be deferred. In this case, Mr. Fawner has requested a deferral so he can go back to the, the drawing board and come up with something that may be more amenable. With those comments being said, I would say that, uh, you know, before we even uh, were aware of the, the septic issue, I think we were, we were very much um, struggling with the application, just in large part, given our, our lack of any implementation mechanisms and, uh, Mr. Fawner is welcome to follow up with me offline. If he has uh, ideas, I would be curious to, to hear them. Thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you very much to the chair. Um, I'm not in support of this, but I uh, think that we should be at least giving Mr. Fawner and the applicant uh, the, uh, the right to a uh, deferral at this time and that they may be able to work something out. I uh, would really doubt it, but I would give them a uh, deferral. That's what they've asked for. Thank you. 
Councillor Burry. Thank you. If we're going to go the deferral route, um, I'd ask that uh, the paved driveway be looked at, uh, ripped up and replaced with Crusher Run, which is permeable. Uh, I'm with uh, many of the other councillors. I, I think the property is just too small. Um, not every property can have every amenity. I think we, I think we're beginning to understand that. Uh, but if we are going to do it um, and and have a deferral, I'd really like to see the the uh, as uh, Councillor Nishikawa has said the the entire hardscaping uh, and stormwater management. And I don't think anyone needs a paved driveway in Muskoka, frankly. Are there any other questions or comments from from the committee? I think we're at a we're at a. Um, Councillor Nishikawa, your final time. Thank you. I, I just want to have, if this is going to be deferred and if this is coming back, um, well, again, I don't know how close we are to the neighbours, even if they were to move it back to 200 feet. How, how, much, how then much closer are they to the neighbours? Because we don't really have that information in front of us. Um, but I have to be concerned about the neighbours uh, and, and, and what they spoke about. Um, and I, I'm concerned that we're hanging our head about this Bill 23. I am sure that they didn't take into consideration Bill 23 and pickleball courts. It was about housing in the, in the most part that I, I have gained from this. Pickleball courts are not habitable, <laughs> like they're, uh, or any of that type of thing. So I don't even know that we should be getting ourselves all tangled up in, you know, this higher power, this higher power, it was mostly about housing. And I'm sure that they didn't in, in think that it was gonna be um, sort of a, a approving pickleball courts. That to me doesn't make any sense in the conversation, but I would like to have a better understanding of how close then if it were moving back that the neighbors are gonna be impacted. Our one last call for comments from the uh, committee. I don't, I'm going to ask for a poll on how many would like to defer this because I think we're kind of split at the moment. So it, could we just have a poll on who would support a deferral? Is that four? Uh, it doesn't look like deferral is going to pass. So I am going to read the motion. Uh, I will caution that the motion is in the positive. Moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved the planning committee recommends the Township Council that zoning bylaw amendment application Castorlin, uh, ZB 3722 Castorlian, roll number 6-19-033 be approved. All those in favor? All those against? Denied. The next application is Z, uh, zoning bylaw 38 slash 22 bylaw 1022 dash 144 uh, Hickey, and that is uh, Ms. Crowder. Thank you, Chair Bosemarth. The next application to be heard is zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 3822 ML bylaw 2022 144 in the name of Hickey. The subject property is known municipally as 1166 Woodruff Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted zoning sketches on pages 186 and 187 of the agenda package. The purpose of zoning bylaw 2022-144 is to provide an exemption from the maximum permitted cumulative single-story boathouse width of 37.9 feet. The cumulative width of the proposed single-story boathouse is 44 feet. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 24 days in advance and three submissions have been received to date. 
The following comments were received and have been circulated to committee prior to today's meeting. Comments have been received from Nick Snyder, the township's chief building official, and Tim Sopko, the township's public works technician, both stating that they have no objection to the application. Comments have been received from the District Municipality of Muskoka, stating that they have no objection to the application. Staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. Staff have recommended that the application be approved. I have no further comments at this time, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the applicant's agent, I guess, is Mr. Fauner again. Yes, I'm, I'm back again. Uh... Chair, uh, again, Steve Fauner, uh, for the record, Steve Fauner, Northern Division Planning Limited, 109 Meadow Heights Drive, Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L1A4. Uh, I'm here representing uh, Sean Hickey uh, and his property on uh, Woodruff Road on uh, Lake Joseph, and he's looking to expand his uh, single-story boathouse uh, over an existing dock. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation once again, and I will go through it uh, quickly. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so the uh, proposed, uh, it is addition, it's over existing docks as mentioned. So uh, we're looking at increasing the width uh, more than what's permitted. And, and part of that is to do with the existing docks in place. Next. So this is the uh, building location survey uh, of the property showing the existing single story boathouse. Uh, the side yard setback is not changing. And you can see the open slip uh, that is there. Next. And this is the uh, proposed uh, boathouse. I think I've got a close up uh, on the next uh, slide. There, thank you. And the, uh, the side yard setback, once again, is not changing. And the side yard setback does comply with the zoning bylaw for a non complying structure. A non complying structure is accepted at the existing setback or down to uh, 15 feet, uh, whichever is greater. And in this case, the boathouse is 24.4 feet and complies with the zoning bylaw. The expansion is uh, over the existing slip uh, as shown before. Next. This is uh, just showing the um, uh, proposal in terms of what it would look like uh, from the water and an oblique view of the uh, proposed uh, boathouse. Next. And this is showing the uh, outline of the slips. Um, you'll note that the uh, slip on the right-hand side is short and that's, um, my client has personal watercraft uh, that would be there and that's all he needs it for as far as a wet slip. The other areas are going to be used for, he does, and we'll see in other pictures, he has canoes, uh, kayaks, and uh, wakeboard boats uh, that will be uh, stored in the uh, other area. Next. So this is a photograph of the existing property. Uh, there's uh, an existing single story boathouse as noted and you can see the dwelling from the, uh, from the water. Next. And just a little bit uh, closer in and you can see the open slip uh, that is there. Next. And you can see this is his lift that he's currently using for his personal watercraft. So he does not use the uh, slip in its, in its entirety. And as mentioned, he's going to actually uh, have more interior space to store. Well, there's uh, a couple of kayaks up against the boathouse right there. Next. I think we've lost Mr. Farner, haven't we? There's a big power outage in Bracebridge. We may have a technical problem bigger than we can fix. <laughs> it seems that the uh, Bracebridge power is out. And I think that's where Mr. Fauner was reporting from. Uh, do we, we take a five minute break here? Yeah, all right. Let's we'll take a five minute break, see if we can get him back on on battery power and uh, go from there.
air. It's not going to. No, I think a trunk hit a hole. Is what I think. All right, we're going to uh, reconvene this uh, meeting. Um, Mr. Hickey, I think, is on the line, and we have a question. Could we get confirmation. Uh, I am on the line. I could certainly answer any questions you may have. Well, um, our first question is, are you happy to proceed without your agent? Uh, I think so. One option is we could defer and see uh, the, later in the meeting, not not defer to another meeting, defer later in the meeting and see if Mr. Fawner is able to come back on, if that would be a better option for you. Um, sure. Um, and if he can't get back on, can we continue the meeting with me uh, representing myself? Yes, we could. So let's we will go through at least the next one and uh, the next one could be fairly quick. Uh, so we might go through the remaining applications and put yours at the end. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. All right. Okay, is that, uh, so we will do that. We will now move on to. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll, they'll have, we'll come back to that. All right, so we'll move on to the next one, which is zoning bylaw amendment 42-22 bylaw 102254 Hellier, uh, which is on Horseshoe Island, and that is Ms. Crowder. Thank you, Chair Bosomworth. The next application to be heard is Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application ZBA 4222ML, Bylaw 2022-154, in the name of Heller. The subject property is known municipally as 14 Horseshoe Island. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted zoning sketch on page 239 of the agenda package. The purpose of zoning bylaw 2022-154 is to restrict cumulative dock width to a maximum of 50 feet. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 24 days in advance and three submissions have been received to date. The following comments were received and have been circulated to committee prior to today's meeting. Comments have been received from Nick Snyder, the Township's Chief Building Official, and Tim Sopko, the Township's Public Works Technician, both stating that they have no objection to the application. Comments were received from the District Municipality of Muskoka, stating that they have no objection to the application. Staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. Staff would note that the explanation that was circulated listed two site-specific bylaw numbers in error. The correct bylaw number associated with this application is bylaw 2022-154. Staff have recommended that the application be approved. I have no further comments at this time, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crowder. Um, is the applicant's agent here? We have an applicant agent. Uh, Ms. Wilson, if you could uh, join us by and start with your name and address, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, Good. perfect, okay. On your uh, video. Heather, Heather Wilson, Heather Wilson Consulting Services, uh, 14 Janelle Street West, Thessalon, uh, P0R1L0. Uh, I'd like to thank the planner for her report. It was very concise. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Heller are simply looking to uh, sever their property into two large lots, the severed lot being vacant other than a dock and a tennis court, but both have been there since, I think it's late 70s or early 80s. Uh, uh, sort of a, a compromise to what he, he initially applied for was to uh, reduce the frontage coverage on the severed severed lot to 50 feet because of the amount of uh, legal non-complying uh, dock that he has on his existing developed portion of the lot. Um, it's And he's happy to do that. He has no problem limiting that size. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Oh, I'm sorry. Is there anybody in uh, favor? of uh, who wish to speak in favor and anybody in opposition? Very well. Uh, any questions from the committee? Uh, 
Ty, who came up first? Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I can support this application. As you can see, there's a dock width of 122 feet now, which is 47 feet over. And that, and if we do uh, approve this, it should be registered on title. Thank you. Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I, I also um, support the application, I, but I had a little concern um, about where future docks may be, like, because there's two sides. And was there a consideration given to that and that I haven't found in the report? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I suppose my, my question goes to uh, Ms. Quabber. Or, I just, I'm a little bit concerned when we have um, frontages on two body water, two sides of the property. Ms. Crowder, could you clarify that for us? Uh, thank you through you, Chair Bosworth, and to you, Councillor Nishikawa. Um, I believe you're referring to um, there's an existing dock on the um, severed lot, the lot in question that we're speaking about, um, whether the 50 foot would be restricted to that side where that existing dock is, or if it's been um, recommended elsewhere. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so there wasn't a specific envelope propo uh, proposed by the applicant, um, and we have just uh, restricted the um, cumulative width per the um, condition of consent from the initial consent application. So it doesn't specify a specific envelope, it um, specifies a specific cumulative width. So I, if I could just further, my concern is just um, something coming back at a later date uh, from whomever is purchasing the property or the, the severed portion and that um, it's just kind of squishy in there. That's all. I'm, I'm just kind of concerned about that. I see the, applic the applicant's agent uh, could call, would like to comment. Please go ahead. Hi. Um the, there is no proposal for any construction on that severed lot at this time. Mr. and Mrs. Heller are simply doing the severance now. Uh, as, it's basically estate planning for future. They do have two children and grandchildren, and they're thinking that they might want to have the lot in the future. So really, there's no proposal for anything on there at this time. Thank you. Are there any other questions from committee? I see, I see none, then I will read the resolution. Moved by Councillor Burry, seconded by Councillor Mazan, be it resolved that Planning Committee recommends to Township Council that zoning bylaw amendment up. Stop it. Come here. Sorry? Okay. All right. <laughs> be it resolved. That planning application recommends to Township Council that zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 38 slash 22, Hickey roll number. No, wrong, wrong resolution. Wrong. Excellent. Uh, you're right. Paper didn't move, did it? We'll come back to Hickey. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Mayor Kelly. Be it resolved that, make sure I got the heller, yes. Be it resolved that. Planning Committee recommends to Township Council that zoning bylaw amendment application ZB 42 slash 22 Heller, roll number 4 22 066 03 be approved. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Seems that Mr. Fawner has returned. Uh, if you could just say hello, Mr. Fawner, just to be sure. Uh, 
Aha, there you are. Which one? Yes, Chair and members of the committee, sorry about that. I've lost my internet here uh, in Bracebridge and uh, I'm not sure what's happening. I'm, I'm just using my phone as a hotspot. So All right. hopefully it'll work too. All right, so we're... we're... We, did, did, did he was still get you were still giving your deputation? All right. So, Mr. Foner, if you could just continue on then. Sure. If we could just uh, put up the uh, PowerPoint presentation, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. That's exactly where we stopped. So I was just pointing out the uh, kayaks here in this particular uh, photo. Uh, next. And he's got canoes, and, and you can see strapped to the back of the uh, boathouse or paddleboard. So uh, they're pretty uh, active families. So uh, um, he would like to have that storage inside, certainly. And that's why he's shortening up that one slip. Next. So this is the uh, boathouse uh, immediately to the uh, uh, northwest. And uh, it's uh, trying to recall the distance. It's approximately, I believe it's about 200 feet at least away from this particular structure. Next. And this is looking in the other direction. And uh, I've estimated off of air photos that uh, were it's over 100 feet to the closest structure, I believe about 125 feet. Next. And this is just taken from the dock and, and uh, towards the dwelling. Next. And this is just behind the dwelling, actually in behind or behind the boathouse. In behind the boathouse, there's an excellent uh, buffer that's there with a the path through it. Next. So in terms of uh, planning analysis, I've, I've noted uh, distances already to uh, uh, the neighbors. And uh, uh, yeah, next, go ahead. The impact on the privacy has been minimal. Uh, you know, we're not dealing with a uh, flat roof boathouse with, um, with a sun deck on it. This has a peaked roof. Uh, and the boathouse doesn't impede any neighboring views. And um, yes, the, the permitted width is slightly more than permitted, but I'm not sure that you would notice the difference too much uh, if you're out in a boat uh, going by. Next. Um, I won't go through the criteria in the official plan. I believe that we've satisfied that in this case, and that was detailed in my planning justification report. And as mentioned, the proposed addition is on existing docks. Next. And uh, lot coverage in this case were uh, quite low, 6.04%, and that's including the addition. And the boathouse is compatible with others along this shoreline. Next. And these are a couple of boathouses directly up the shoreline. Uh, this boathouse is actually going to be similar to that uh, two-slip two boathouse um, if it's approved. Next. So in terms of conclusions, um, it's uh, my opinion that it's, you know, it's a reasonable application has merit. Uh, it's on existing docks. Uh, it's going to have a hip roof as opposed to a flat roof. So there'd be very little impact on privacy, a very little change on the side yard setback is not changing uh, at its closest point. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. My apologies for my outage here. Thank you, Mr. Foner. Uh, is there anybody who would wish to speak in favor of this application? And is there anybody wishing to speak against this application? Elizabeth Wilfit, if you could bring her on. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, if you could start with your name and your address, please. We can't hear you yet. Good morning. And um, first of all, congratulations on all your elections and re-elections. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of my brother, Lawrence Sleeth, and myself, Elizabeth Sleeth Wilford. We own the property 1170 next Woodruff Road, um, Foots Bay, postal code P0C1H0. Um, we are the immediate neighbors to the Northwest. I just wanna say that the photos that were taken of the distance are very deceiving. 
that you saw, it's a lot closer than that. My question is, why is the extra six feet needed? This is the second time this fall we've been here for a bylaw amendment from the Hickeys. I'm feeling like a frequent flyer, and I've seen many of you from the three meetings we had previously. Having been a municipal councillor in Richmond Hill and sitting on, sitting on many times the planning committee, I do, I do appreciate and am very supportive of the decisions that the Muskoka Lakes Township have made creating these bylaws to support all the taxpayers. The added floor space, the dock that looks to me like it will be an all weather room. I realize that noise is not a factor in planning, but however, this room, my fear is that the Mickeys and their guests are already excessively noisy. I am constantly being evicted, so to speak, from my dock because I just can't think, I can't read, the noise is so loud. I have spoken to Mrs. Hickey on occasion and so have my neighbors. My big concern is that this extra six feet will create an all weather party room. There's already a fridge down there and this will just become more excessive um, with swearing, which does occur frequently and the loud, loud music. I even go up to my own cottage, close the windows, put on the news to try and drown it out and it's not drowned out. So I, my big concern is that this extra space will create a party room during rain. I, no, nobody in Muskoka prays for rain and cold weather, but I do to keep them off the dock. So that's my, my concern. And um, I do not approve this extra footage. Thank you, Mitch Wilford. Um, is there anybody else in the waiting room to speak against that? Uh, Mr. Fauner, would you like to comment? Yeah, just commenting on a couple of items. Um, yes, when the photos are taken, the camera is set at the normal camera setting, which is slightly wide angle, so it does appear to be a little farther than it is. I would say, however, that the setback to the westerly boundary of the Hickey property is approximately 160 feet, just of that setback on their own property. So they're significantly set back to um, uh, the Wilford property. In terms of noise, yeah, it's a difficult thing because when you're out over the water, um, you know, potentially that can happen certainly from a dock. Um, I've been told by the applicant that he has watercraft that he wants to store inside. If he were to use that as some sort of indoor space, it, depending on how you look at it, maybe it's sometimes better that people are indoors. If they can close the doors, they might be quieter. Um, but I'm not sure. I know the township has been struggling with the use of uh, uh, the first story of boathouses, but I know that the township is also considering actually providing provisions in its zoning bylaw at some point in time regarding some amenity space on the first floor. Um, you know, I'm not sure that it's going to be used that way. I know that I've seen boathouses where they've actually got approval and then they've closed in a slip or closed in both slips and used it entirely as a large room over the water. And it's very difficult for the municipality to enforce that because the definition of boathouse says that it's for mooring of boats or storage of marine related equipment. And as soon as you put a canoe or a kayak in it, you're storing marine related equipment or even life jackets for that matter. So it is a very difficult one to monitor. Um, I don't know the Hickey family that well. I don't know. I know they're active physically from what I've been told. I don't know how active they are in terms of uh, evening activities and that kind of thing. I'm not aware of that, but uh, that is something as we know in Muskoka that, you know, the, the neighbors, you hope that they can come to an agreement as to uh, what is reasonable noise and what isn't, because that's certainly a very common occurrence uh, along the waterfront. And uh, 
all I can, I guess the best thing I can say is that we've got a significant setback to that lot line. As they say on the Hickey property, it's 160 feet. And uh, uh, that's, you know, when your minimum permitted for a new structure is 30 feet and a pre-existing one is 15 feet, uh, 160 is pretty significant. So um, it's really all I can say to that. I think it's a uh, zoning doesn't control uh, people's behaviors, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, and I apologize if it's been a problem for the neighbors, but that's something that they really would have to straighten out themselves. Um, and they'll have to do that on their own accord. Really, the zoning can't uh, can't zone for for noise, for example. Thank you, Mr. Fawner. Um, uh, let me just turn it back to Ms. Wilfred for one more time. Thank you. Um, my concern is that you can turn a closet into a room with six feet. Um, and this additional space, I have no objection to, to a boathouse being expanded to the set bylaws. But every time we're turning around, it seems like we're at, we're saying no to the bylaws to the way that people have very, spent a lot of time figuring out what's the best bylaw and every time I've sat here, actually I've been sitting here since quarter to nine and I've listened to every, everyone's um, application and noted that you have said from the beginning that why are we changing bylaws for no reason. Thank you very much. Let me turn this now over to the committee. Are there any questions uh, for the committee? Councillor Nishikawa first up, then Moy Councillor Moyer Kent. Thank you. I, I should first uh, say that um, through you, my, I, I want to just make a comment before I ask my question, but um, I recall, Mr. Fawner would recall this when, and in fact, we had Mr. Judges on earlier today who was asked to be on a committee to determine what size a boathouse, the minimum size a boathouse should be. And for instance, we got down to like really the nitty gritties of anything smaller than 33 feet was not accommodating a boat, for example, and safe, um, those safe issues. So what I see today, and, and staff can confirm this for me, is that this application is for marine uses in a boathouse. I don't see any uh, bedroom on the plans, I don't see any of that. Uh, so I have to trust that the applicant has applied for what is what I read today. And that is, if anybody was here, I have to trust that the applicants are, are honorable and that they will live by the plans that they've submitted. So does staff have a concern about the plans that were submitted? I don't feel that 40 feet is um, I think it's a, sort of a necessary, quite frankly, and that the the, uh, the distance between the neighbor is um, is quite adequate, honestly. But if staff have a concern about um, what may or may not be, is that part of this application today? Sorry, was that a question, uh, Councillor Nishikawa? Does staff have a concern that what is being applied for today is not really what they're applying for? Like it's going to be used in a different way. Ms. Crowder, if you want to answer that. Thank you. Through you, Chair Balsamworth, and to you, Councillor Nishikawa. Um, it is my understanding that the purpose of this um, enlarged boathouse width is to enclose um, marine uh, watercrafts. The boathouse, or sorry, the dock slip is already existing, and I believe that this is um, just to enclose it. If you look at page 188 of the agenda package, we do have um, a drawing of the proposed boathouse, and it does show, um, to me, it, it appears to be solely to, to enclose a watercraft. Councillor Moyer Kent. Actually, I'm going to discuss that specific question. Um, I see that the existing slip, the second slip that they're only going to fill in, use halfway. In front of that slip, there's plenty of room for 
marine storage. I cannot understand why they need the extra squared in space, all glassed in, of course, which to me looks like it's going to be, and you know, I am being a bit skeptical here of the intent, is going to become another sitting area on the main floor, which I deem as unnecessary uh, for marine storage. And I think that uh, it did look a bit tight on the right side of the boathouse. So maybe you need another foot or two to close in the slip and allow some, some walkway along the right side of that slip. But I don't see any reason as, uh, and I forget your name, the woman who just spoke, um, why they would need the extra uh, enclosed glassed in, very open to the public and the public waterway on the front side uh, for anything apart from a couch and a television, which I envision would end up there. Anyway, that's, uh, so my view is I'd support the proposal because I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I don't think they need the extra square footage on the right side. Comments from the rest of the committee or questions? Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, uh, looking at page 190 with the bump out and that uh, the forward wall is almost right tight to the, the slip and then it, it bumps out. I don't know how many feet that is, six or eight feet. Uh, the, 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 the drawing is so, so foggy, you just can't get a measurement, but I don't see that's actually required. You can get the boat in. I would maybe move it over a couple of feet so they could walk around that one side of the slip and that and uh, see if they can get it down under the 44 feet. They're asking for six, six foot three more than they, they need, but that just looks like a bump out. And that and there's plenty of storage. When you look at the center of, of that drawing, there's lots of room in there and that for storage. So just a question. Thank you. Um, let me ask, is there any more comments, uh, any more councillors who feel the same way? Councillor Zavitz? Uh, thank you through you. I feel the same way. <laughs> I share, I, I share Councillor Edwards' concern. So we do, we do have some, uh, a, a number of councillors concerned about this. Um, Mr. Fawner, would your clients consider uh, removing the bump out and uh, but making the overall boathouse just a little bit wired so you could have access on that right hand slip of the uh, of the sea do? Well, that's something I'd have to talk to uh, my client about. I, I think it's fairly reasonable in these cases to, at the very least, run that wall down the center of the uh, dock that's there for support and, and access on each side. Now, what he's asking for in terms of an additional slight uh, increase in width is, I think that amounts to only about four feet if that, um, to run it down to taking off the, uh, uh, with it shown there and running it down the, the wall that's beside the shorter slip, like you've got pretty much no access to that side of the slip at all. And that's, uh, you know, there should at least be consideration for that. Uh, I, I would suggest, you know, we may look at something that's slightly narrower, but I don't think to take off that whole bump out, um, I don't think it's reasonable and, and entirely practical, actually, to run it down that close to that side of the slip for the whole distance. All right, then let me just get a straw uh, straw vote here. I don't want to use this too often, but just to get a sense, I think there is we've got about three three councillors concerned, and we just have a, a raise of hands of who's concerned about the the bump out one, two, three. All right, four. Well. I think that is not enough. Uh, so I will read the. Councillor Burry, you have your hand up. Sorry. Thank you. Uh... I, 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 I do. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Bolsworth. Um, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole today of uh, habitable space on single floor boathouses, <clears throat> which I will remind this council isn't up to us. And it 
it's up to the province. It's a provincial regulation on how boathouses are used. I've had a problem with this for the last two years as the official plan was being done and why planning didn't go back to the Ontario government to, to get a clarification on this. It's different if you lease your land uh, underneath your boathouse, and it's even more different if you own the land underneath your two-story boathouse. Uh, the Ontario regulation, it does have some ambiguity in, in it, but quite frankly, uh, what we've been trying to do as a council for, and I'm new, so, but the councils have been doing is, is pushing the partying back, right? Keeping it away from the waterfront where it does carry. And, and we all have bad neighbors, uh, or not all of us. I mean, I have some great neighbors, but each of us in, in our society can have some, some neighbors that, uh, that, that party too much. I, the whole idea of, of uh, I, I think we need to, you know, fire a shot across the bow to say, if you're, if you're going to be, if, if specifically, you're gonna, we have to start somewhere. If you're going to put habitable space down there, we're going to send bylaw in. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to particularly pick on, on, on this particular application, which seems pretty reasonable. Uh, but that being said, you know, we're, we're opening uh, that this, uh, this rabbit hole of habitable space on the main floor of a boathouse, which is an illegal activity in the province of Ontario. Mr. Pink, would you like to comment? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, just to assist committee in their deliberations, I, I completely appreciate uh, the concerns. This will come up often with certain proposals about potential future use. But I think it's important to stress that the application before you is for six feet of added width to a boathouse. That's the request before you. That's the decision to make. There's no application before you about what the use within uh, is going to be. The zoning bylaw sets what the use is permitted to be. The applicant's required to comply with that. If they don't, it's a bylaw enforcement issue. It's a, it's a difficult issue to enforce, admittedly, but it's a bylaw enforcement issue. And if we uh, for example, we're to refuse the application, and that would be our entire argument about what an owner may potentially do. I've seen it many times at the tribunal. It will not be successful. We will be told by the chair to enforce your bylaws. Uh, what's before a committee, again, is six feet of boathouse width. I would um, uh, clarify, though, uh, slightly. Uh, staff, again, completely appreciates the concern. Uh, we've brought forward a number of reports about the use of boathouse space and the use of uh, accessory buildings on land as well and we brought a number of reports to planning committee at the last term of council and the prior term i believe uh, which uh, which committee is still uh, deliberating and discussing and we can bring back or roll it into the comprehensive zoning bylaw review um, but there are mechanisms through zoning which we can gain better controls and the official plan a review is the first step and we can look at future amendments to the zoning bylaw to clarify uh, just very quickly on councillor burry's points as well um, I think you're generally correct. It is a provincial issue in that they need a land use permit to um, utilize boathouses for living space, but I wouldn't characterize it necessarily as illegal. If they do that without the land use permit, that's correct. That's not permitted. However, the province does regularly issue those approvals. So two-story boathouses, for example, uh, those owners will either purchase the lake bed uh, from the province or lease that land and obtain a land use permit to use it for something other than marine storage. So it is permitted. I don't think lobbying the province would necessarily change it. I think we can look at our own bylaws and plug those loopholes. Uh, I think what staff's proposed, and I'm sure returning councillors remember, uh, some controls about open space in a boathouse uh, being required, some open water, uh, and those types of measures to get a better control of this. But defeating applications for three, four, five, six feet of width um, is likely not going to be the successful approach. I would encourage us to look at the zoning bylaw and we're at your direction as to when you want us to bring that uh, that process back. So hopefully those comments are helpful to move uh, this discussion along and also uh, from a broader perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pink. Uh, comment from Councillor uh, Zavitz. Well, thank you. And I'll certainly defer to those wise words from our Director, uh, Director Pink. I think uh, to your point, David, what, <laughs> You know, when one looks at the schematics, one looks at the drawings and sees uh, nothing but uh, doors on, uh, you know, the lake side the, and, and the one side and then on the back, 
Uh, there's only a few windows in this whole building and they're on the other side. So my point is it, it certainly does look like a party um, access, something that we, uh, we you know, we, we frown on. We, at least we have bylaws. I think as Councillor Burry said, we'd send, you know, bylaw would go in there if all the uh, stars were aligned. Um, so here we are supporting and voting for something positively that we don't even allow. Thank you. One last call for comments from the committee. Let me read the resolution then. Moved by Councillor Burry, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that the plan that planning committee recommends to the to Township Council that zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 38-22 Hickey roll number 4-7-031 be approved. All those in favor? One, two. Opposed? All those opposed? That is carried. Thank you and have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Our final zoning application is ZBA 43-22 Howard, part of Lot 8 Concession B, Tobin Island. And uh, planner on this is Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Chair Bosomworth. Um, the next application to be heard is uh, zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 43-22 in the name of Howard. Uh, this subject property is located on Tobin Island on Lake Rosso. And the, um, the lots on this island are, have been assigned lot numbers and this property is identified as lot 27. <clears throat> I'd just like to note a few minor administrative details. Um, as a result of an administrative error, the circulated public notice had included a copy of the draft bylaw and um, it showed an incorrect location map attached to schedule one. Uh, the correct location map is attached to the draft bylaw that is before committee today and posted on the agenda on the uh, um, township's website and part of the agenda. Also, the public notice indicates that Carolyn Ferre Howard is the owner of the property. Since then, the applicant um, has or the applicants have provided documentation to clarify that the property is also owned by Peter Howard. I would direct committee's attention to the sketches starting on page 266 of today's agenda package. Uh, the purpose and effect of the application is to facilitate the demolition of the existing dock and the construction of a new dock and a single story boathouse. The purpose of the application is also to repeal an existing site specific bylaw, which was approved in 2004 and permits a dock uh, within a defined, uh, defined location but uh, prohibits boathouses. Since a boathouse is now proposed, one of the purposes of the bylaw is to repeal the, um, the, the bylaw and um, uh, repeal the former bylaw and replace it with a new bylaw that permits the proposed development. Um, the maximum permitted length for a dock is 66 feet. In this case, the near shore area is shallow and the applicant has therefore requested a zoning exemption to permit the dock to project 83 feet, uh, which is 17 feet longer than the permitted length that is permitted as of right um, at 66 feet. And uh, similarly, an exemption is requested from the maximum permitted boathouse length of 50 feet is proposed that the one story boathouse extend 81 feet from the shoreline. Where a single story boathouse with a rooftop sun deck is proposed, the minimum permitted side yard setback is 45 feet. In this case, a rooftop sun deck is proposed um, with a side yard setback of 34.5 feet. An exemption has therefore been requested. Uh, notice of this public meeting was circulated 20 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act, and 10 submissions have been received to date, which include um, seven comments from members of the public. All of these um, 
comments with the exception of uh, one was received yesterday um, and which was received yesterday have been provided to committee in advance and I'll provide a summary um, of these comments and would be happy to read them in full if requested to do so by committee. Uh, the District of Muskoka, the Townships Development Services Division, and the Public Works Department have advised that they have no objections. All seven of the comments received from members of the public are from neighbours within Johns Bay, which is the bay that this property fronts onto, and uh, they are all in opposition. I'll provide a summary, uh, but would be happy to read any of the submissions in full if requested by committee. Um, Three separate submissions have been received from members of the family that owns the property at number 29 to the east of the subject property. Uh, these were from Gail Coptis, um, sorry, Gail Coptis Tanner and Ruth Coptis and Karen Coptis. In summary, their comments state that the bylaw is an environmentally sensitive area that the bay is an environmentally sensitive area and therefore the new bylaw should not be passed and the past bylaw should not be repealed. Uh, Gordon Stone from property number 22 uh, states safety concerns for boats turning around at the end of the bay and uh, suggested that a boat port be considered instead of a boat house. Uh, Thomas Turner from property number 23 was under um, states that he was under the impression that a boathouse would not be constructed on the shoreline and again is in opposition. Um, Edward Rogers, owners of two vacant properties in Johns Bay, um, states that he bought his properties with the aim of preserving and maintaining the environmentally sensitive nature of Johns Bay and it was his understanding that a boathouse would not be constructed along the subject property shoreline. Uh, Stephen and Kathy Niblett from the budding property to the north, um, which is identified as um, property number 26, um, advised that their property and an extension Johns Bay has been registered as a federal aerodrome and the extension of the existing dock um, as proposed and the construction of the proposed boathouse would negatively impact aircraft that are approaching their seaplane dockage. Uh, the Niblets have also expressed concern with permitting a boathouse along a shoreline where it is currently not permitted. And uh, the letter also mentions concerns with potential tree removal and notes a discrepancy in the location of the portion of the dock that connects to the shoreline. Schedule two of the draft bylaw shows this connecting portion of the dock being located towards the south of the structure while the site plan that has been circulated shows this dock extension located further to the north. Um, Mr. Niblett states that either lo location would require the removal of some trees along the shoreline, which would impact his family's privacy. Mr. Niblett, uh, or the Niblets, um, also raised concerns related to the environmental sensitivity of the bay. Uh, staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration and have recommended approval of the application provided two requirements are satisfied prior to third reading. In this case, a um, fish habitat assessment has been completed by Riverstone Environmental, which concludes that the location of the proposed dock and boathouse would not negatively impact fish habitat. Uh, Riverstone also advises that the potential impact on fish habitat of a boathouse is essentially the same as for a dock. Um, however, Riverstone does recommend that their fish habitat assessment be circulated to the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans to ensure the proposal um, complies with the Federal Fisheries Act. Uh, since feedback from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has not yet been received, staff have recommended that uh, third reading of the bylaw not be given until compliance with the Fisheries Act has been confirmed. Uh, in addition, staff have recommended the removal or relocation of an existing storage rack prior to third reading. The struc um, this structure is not in compliance with the applicable setback requirements and uh, therefore should be moved to a compliant location or be removed altogether. Although not noted in the resolution before committee today, staff would also recommend a minor amendment to the draft bylaw to correctly show the proposed dock configuration on schedule two to the bylaw. Uh, the applicant's agent has 
now advise that the proposed connecting dock is to be located in the northerly position as shown on the circulated site plan and not in the southerly position as currently shown on schedule two to the bylaw. So therefore this change should be made and uh, staff have no, no concerns with this change as both positions are within the, the uh, development envelope identified by Riverstone Environmental. Uh, lastly, I would like to just mention that the applicant's agent has advised that the applicant would like to request a deferral today in order to provide time to further consider the comments that have been received from members of the public. And I believe the applicant's agent, uh, Rick Hunter, is here today to speak to the application and uh, the requested deferral. And I have no further comments at this time, but would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sawyer. Um, the applicant's agent, I believe, is Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter, if you could proceed stating your name and address first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, before you and in your all your new capacities. Um, my name is Richard Hunter. I'm a, a senior associate with Planscape Inc. out of uh, Bracebridge, 104 Kimberley Avenue. Um, and uh, P1L1 Z8 is the postal code. Um, as noted, I represent uh, Peter and Carolyn Howard, the owners of uh, 27 Tobins Island. Uh, Mr. Howard is uh, in on the uh, the um, presentation as well, and uh, he may may wish to speak when I'm completed, or he may just be available for questions, uh, depending on on uh, on how the the discussions go. Um, as I'd like to to first of all thank uh, your your staff for the uh, the very detailed. Review and work that they've undertaken on the um, on the property, uh, including uh, inspecting the property in the uh, sort of the end of November. I think during one of our earlier snowstorms, um, we've uh, received the comments or reviewed the comments from the neighboring property owners, including the owner of the aerodrome on the adjacent property to the north and west. Um, I'd like to thank the staff, obviously, for providing those those to us. Um, We've also reviewed the township's uh, staff report and had numerous discussions uh, with, uh, with the planning office and we support the recommendations and conditions that are suggested in the report. Um, I, I would note uh, specifically, we have submitted the request to, to DFO uh, for, the, uh, for the approval. Um, I understand that the uh, approval from DFO has, has come in, but we've not yet um, uh, submitted that to the municipality. Uh, as, as it relates to the um, um, covered uh, boat rack uh, that the owners have, have agreed that they will be removing that. Uh, the problem right now is with the amount of ice on the lake, they can't get a boat to the property. And, and with the amount of ice on the lake, they can't uh, cross the, la the lake. So it'll be removed as soon as the, the weather conditions allow it. Um, and the, the third item that, uh, that Mr. Soya mentioned uh, regarding the schedule two to the bylaw. Um, again, that was an error. It's always a difficult sometimes difficult to keep track of of all the amendments that have gone on with that with applications and, and it's clearly the the north location for the um the walkway or the pathway to, to link to the dock and boathouse um is the, the preferred location uh on on the um on on the property um i would note as well to to clarify one item um the location of the access is virtually identical to the current access of the existing dock and again there is no requirement or there's no tree removal that would be required to um, accommodate the uh, the new dock location on on the property um i, I would uh note again follow up on on mr soya's comments um in order to provide us with the time to review and respond to the comments submitted we are requesting that the committee defer the application likely to the next meeting. Um, this will allow us to also get in comments on the, the removal of the, uh, the storage rack, um, submit the, the DFO comments and, uh, and ensure that the, the proposal adequately responds to any comments and questions that have been, uh, been submitted. Um, we've been working with the owners to determine if it would be feasible to develop a single story boathouse on their property and located at the end of Johns Bay. Uh, in addition to the planning review, also as noted by by uh, by Mr. Soya, um, Al Shaw from Riverstone Environmental was retained to prepare a fish habitat assessment on the um, on the site, and his review and work um, 
confirmed that uh, that the area where the boathouse is proposed, again, the, the northerly 50 feet or so of the property, uh, that it would be outside of the type one fish habitat and would be would be appropriate. The, uh, the site plan that, that we are looking at was on page 11 of the township staff report. Um, and again, it shows the footprint of the dock and, and the boathouse. Both the planning justification report and the fish habitat assessment are attached with your agenda package and provide uh, the detail on how the application um, meets the criteria of the provincial policy statement, the planning act, and uh, and uh, again, how, how the uh, exemption is being proposed to the zoning bylaw. Uh, as I mentioned, the fish habitat study confirms that the proposed location of the boathouse would be occurring in the type two fish habitat area and the proposed location and scale of the facility are appropriate for the development of a boathouse at this location. And that includes the projections into the water to accommodate the, uh, the shallow, shallow water. And also, um, if you notice on the design of the proposal that the, the actual dock structure and boathouse structure start um, at least uh, nine meters, or, uh, 29 feet from the shoreline to allow for maintaining that uh, flooded land area to be um, to be not uh, not covered by by structures again from an environmental perspective that's a desirable thing to be doing um so again the the property itself is located at the end of the bay uh, with the shallow water uh, the proposal does rec request the uh, approval for an extended extension to the dock to a maximum of 83 feet and the boathouse to 81 feet to provide this for sufficient water depths for safe and wearing watercraft. The location at the end of the bay will not create, in my opinion, any issues related to navigation, it will not create any negative visual impacts on other residents further up the bay just because of the way the properties are, are located. The proposal that's before you is considerably smaller than, um, than the maximum would normally be allowed uh, for a lot with 300 feet of frontage, whether it's uh, on, on this site or elsewhere on Johns Bay or elsewhere on, on, um, on the lake. Mr. Hunter, you are, yes. you are past your five minutes. So oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, had, uh, I, I just wanted to, to uh, finally indicate that we're designed to minimize the shoreline impact. And again, we're prepared to answer any questions that may come up on it, uh, we feel we support your staff's recommendation on the application. My apologies for going over time. Is there anybody who would like to speak in favor of this application? And is there anybody online who would like to speak against this application? Marilee Coptis, um, if you could uh, start by stating your name and address, please. And he shall be followed by Mr. Niblett. Ms. Coptis Carey, you could uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. All right, I am Mary Lee Coptis Carey the daughter of William and Ruth Coptis, who purchased the property in 1968. We are now enjoying our third generation as a family, coming about with fourth generation uh, little ones. Um, our concern is that number one, yes, uh, I did listen that there is a fisheries report uh, that's been done and I'm glad it's been requested to, set, um, to be sent on to the federal um, because this bay really is an eco-sensitive area. Um, the owners were well aware of the shallowness when they purchased the property. Uh, nothing has changed from that way environmentally. It's been like that since the beginning when I was a little girl and enjoyed going down there in the canoe. But anyhow, the concern is, is that you have five property owners within that 800 feet that will be affected by this. And in listening to the comments of those submitted, and um, I did submit um, it in write my comments in writing, but I wanted to be on the call as well. And I'm glad I am because um, you didn't mention you had received my comments. But anyhow, with that said, um, as Mr. Stone said, that is a, that boats come down uh, on a regular basis thinking they can actually pass through. And we've had day and night um, over the years, 
where a boat will be entering John's Bay and then realize it's not a pass through. They have to go uh, around Ethel's Point to uh, get through the gap. So that's a danger right there. And they have to make a quick turnaround. And there have been boats that have uh, actually gone, gone too far in. So number one, extending the dock causes a great concern. And then also putting a structure of a, a boathouse that was never intended to have a boathouse is of great concern to um, obviously all of the, neighbor, the surrounding neighbors. Um, and when, with that said, um, these, what you have been so astute in providing over the past consuls is that these bylaws and, and these provisions and protection for our beautiful Muskoka have been put into place with a lot of wisdom and discernment. And our concern as a family is, will this start other you know, repeals into something for it to become something other than what Muskoka needs to be in protecting its property and environment and beauty, the bounty of its beauty. So thank you very much for allowing me to make these comments and also congratulations to those new council members and the, re and the returning ones. Thank you very much. Could you give us your address, please? Oh, my address, I apologize. It is um, in, the, in Muskoka, it's property 29. R60 Johns Bay, Tobin Island. Um, and our address in the United States is, uh, my, my address is 432 East Heritage Drive, Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, USA, 44223. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank Ms. You. Niblett, you are now up. Um, please state your name and address and what you'd like to say. Uh, thanks, Councillor uh, Chair Bosenworth. I appreciate you and the council uh, hearing me. My name is Stephen Niblett. My wife, Kathy, and I own the property at 26 Tobins Island, uh, Windermere, Ontario, uh, P0B1P0. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, I know that there's been a lot of letters have been written, and my letter is pretty much surmised uh, on this. Uh, obviously, I have great concern uh, over extension of this boathouse. Not only is it well outside what the building rules are, um, it's also outside what you know the previous council had decided and what has been in place for 19 years. Um, but I am a federally licensed aerodrome, and I don't think they had a chance to, I'm assuming the council gets a chance to read all these, but to make it short and, and just to clarify, I'm also representing myself and the neighbor to the south, uh, Edward Rogers, who couldn't be on this call. Um, but let me draw you my, regarding the aerodrome. First of all, uh, Section 5.4 of the Aeronautics Act clearly states that um, the Transport Canada may enact the AZR, which are aircraft zoning uh, rules, to protect aircraft from hazards. Number one, to protect air, existing airport operations. And number uh, three, to ensure that future development in or near an airport stays compatible with the safe operation of aircraft. Um, I'm the primary pilot that goes in there and I've got a lot of time, uh, flying planes. Um, I have a tough time getting into that bay. I will use up every square inch right along the Howard stock as it is to get into that bay. I have to land on the pilot side. I have to come into wind. I can't go straight at it and make a 90 degree turn. Um, a lot of aircraft come in there for uh, safe harbor last June. We had three in there because it was a rough water and, and planes are going to go down. Um, guys could barely make the turn. Uh, there's risks of running into the, the boathouse. Uh, there's just not enough room to turn. If you were to extend that an inch, uh, my wing is going into the boathouse, plain and simple. Um, it's a hazard of anybody trying to back out of that boathouse. Um, I, there's, I, I could potentially lose my aerodrome status because I do get inspected every year. Um, that is, you know, of utmost concern to me and, and, and the federal, uh, aeronautics act is pretty clear on this. Um, and you know, there's a, secondly, um, this, this proposal is far outside the existing building rules. 66 feet is the max dock, 50 feet out from shores for the boathouse. This is, uh, 81 feet boathouse. That's 42% further. It's almost the distance of, of my boathouse. I have a boathouse next door. 
I am shallow. I have to trim up to go into my boathouse. Should I be applying for 81 feet? Because I'm telling you, that would really be beneficial to me. I wouldn't disturb the lake bottom at all. And now we'd have two 81 foot boathouses right up on the top of each other. It's ridiculous. I mean, this is this is a precedent we want to set. Um, it's never harmed anybody in the 19 years it's been there. Um, it may be a problem with shallow water, but that's what you know, the engines trim tabs are for trims are for. Um, I have I have the same issue. Um Secondly, um, I, I thank you for clarifying where that, that dock is going to the north. Um, and I would, I don't know if you have time, but it, figure 11 shows where the standard trees are to the existing walkway. The new proposed walkway is, uh, I believe, about 10 feet to the south of that walkway and is right in the middle of the last group of trees that provide any kind of privacy. There's a picture on figure 11 that shows standing on the deck, looking down at their uh, existing dock, and my boat has can be seen in the end. Those trees will have to go. Unfortunately, the previous owners, the Morsums, clear cut that lot. And I would refer to, I think it's uh, figure four and five versus figure eight, which is my property that's untouched. Well, the whole shoreline looked like that originally. They've clear cut it. Uh, any more cutting is, is you know, that <laughs> there's no more buffer. There's no more privacy for me. Um, unfortunately, this bay lends itself to um, being very quiet. I mean, I can honestly, with due respect, I can hear every conversation on uh, Howard's dot, uh, deck up on their on their uh, up on the cottage, just because it's so shallow uh, and quiet. It's calm. It's protected out of the wind. It acts like a loud hailer. It's surrounded by high cliffs. You can hear everything that comes out of there. So that would also be another reason why uh, absolutely couldn't wouldn't want to have a two story boathouse or a one story boathouse with a sun deck, which we all know turns into, you know, quasi living space or party space or whatever. It's just, it's just way too loud. It, unfortunately, due to the nature of the bay, it just echoes down the bay. Um, and, you know, to, to reiterate what the cop has uh, said, you know, I, I was under the plan that this boathouse couldn't uh, have been built here. Um, and I'll give you a little history of that because I actually bought my property from Barry Base who was the one who severed this law in the original builder of the cottage. Uh, he told me, along with Dr. Peter Morse, who now uh, the Turners own their property. Fortunately, he's passed away. And unfortunately, so is uh, Bill or William Coft has passed away. But they fought hard against this severance. I, it wasn't going to be allowed. Uh, it was in, for many reasons. I think it was environmentally sensitive. It was a fish habitat. Um, regardless, nobody wanted that there. And the compromise was that none of the trees were to be cut. Of course, the Morsons took care of that. That's gone, they're gone. And no boathouse was to be built. That was the wish and desire of the council in 2004. We have bylaws that are enacted for a reason, because of the neighbors, because of input, and what the council then thought was the correct thing to do. I asked that the council maintain this. Otherwise, what's the point of having these bylaws? Mr. Niblett, um, you're at your five minutes. Okay, I'm at my five minutes. That's all I want to say. And I'm happy I answer any questions. Thank you for your time. Is there anybody else in opposition to this? All right. So let me turn this over to the committee. Do we have any questions? Does the, would the agent like to respond to any of the comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that uh, uh, assuming if the committee is uh, going to consider going for a deferral, I think we would just sort of prepare our, our, our uh, responses um, uh, appropriately um, at that, that point. Um, in particular, um, I really appreciate uh, Mr. Newlett's uh, comments and, and the relationship with the federal federal requirements. And again, that's something that from a jurisdictional perspective, uh, you know, the, the owners need to, to be able to work out. Um, and uh, we do appreciate uh, the design of, of the facility in the first place tries to ensure that the uh, natural environment is protected. Um, I would point out there is no no need for any tree removal as a result of the new dock new dock arrangement uh, on the site. Um, but other than that, yes, I, I'd prefer to hold off and, and uh, submit uh, submit the more formal comments, uh, you know, at, at, uh, at a later date as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Kelly. 
Uh, thank you, and through you, and, and it may be covered off in, in whatever comes back if we have a deferral. Uh, Mr. Niblet raised something that is new to me, and that is uh, some constraints on our ability to deal with, uh, with uh, property rights adjacent to or in the neighborhood or vicinity of an aerodrome. Uh, I understand the aerodrome is federally reg uh, uh, regulated, so I was looking for some guidance on that, and uh, either now or at a subsequent date, if somebody wants to come back with that, that'd be great. Thank you. Mr. Sharp, I see if you've come on. Do you have some comments on that? Thank you, Chair Bosomworth. Um, I do have an aerial photograph of the property um, that actually shows what I believe to be Mr. Niblett's uh, plane parked at uh, his boathouse. Um, it wasn't until his comments uh, came in uh, that we actually realize that his property uh, constitutes an aerodrome. These properties tend to quote unquote, fly under the radar, so to speak, pardon my pun. Um, but uh, upon receipt of his comment, I was uh, certainly interested just to find out more myself uh, with respect to you know how this uh, proposed shoreline structure um, may implicate uh, federal requirements. So I ended up actually speaking with a, a gentleman um, who is a, his title is Civil Aviation Safety Inspector of Aerodromes and Air Navigation with Transport Canada. And to be clear, um, just from the outset, I'm no expert in regard to uh, civil aviation, uh, but I can uh, try to relay some of my insights provided uh, by this gentleman that I spoke with. Um, first and foremost, uh, he advised me that airport zoning regulations do not apply to aerodromes. Um, these regulations apply to major airports like Pearson International. Um, so airports on that scale, not to, to aerodromes. He also advised that uh, aerodromes um, are regulated under part three of the Canadian aviation um, regulations. And through some guidance documents that he sent, I understand that Transport Canada does not um, opine on um, whether, you know, for example, in this instance, an adjacent shoreline structure um, would uh, affect uh, an aerodrome. It's my understanding that uh, those types of matters um, would constitute a civil matter um, that would need to be argued between two parties in front of uh, the courts um, should they wish to pr pursue that avenue. So that's what I took from my conversation with this gentleman. Um, if committee, uh, would like more information or has further questions that they would like answered, um, my recommendation would be to adjourn the application so that uh, those answers and information can be provided. Thank you. Well, let me throw it out to council or to, to committee rather. Um, if there were some more comments, I think we could do that, but we now have two requests for adjournment. Um, so that seems to be the probable preferred course, but let me open it up for further comments. Councillor Nishikawa. Sorry, could you please go to Councillor Roberts first and then... Um, my, apologies. my apologies, Councillor Robert. Your yellow hand is up in the top left corner and, it, and behind it is also a yellow wall, so I couldn't oh. see. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Councillor Roberts, and thank you, Nishikawa. Councillor right. Thank you, Nish Councillor uh, Nishikawa and Chair. Yes, um, I, I had just lost my inter my connectivity just as uh, uh, Bryce was speaking, and uh, I am fully in support of a deferral on this, given the, the whole circumstance with the Airdome. With the, the, and and it, I want to correct one thing. My understanding is that the the agent said there was no navigable issues. Well, when an airplane is now on water, I believe it becomes a watercraft, and there is a very much a, a, an issue um, with that that air, that airplane coming in and turning at the bottom of the bay, and uh, so there is an issue. So I, we really got to think about this and have clarity on this before we make a decision. Um, uh, the the other thing that really concerns me on this is that the previous council in two thousand and four there was a compromise made. Um, our records show, uh, you know, we, we, I guess there was not a great job at that time in doing the minutes of the meeting, 
And so the, it, 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 according to the staff report, um, but um, you know, the, the neighbors that are there that have the history in that say that there was a significant compromise made that there'd be no boathouses. So I'd like to know a lot more about that because uh, I, I don't think we should be overturning um, just very without, without a lot of considerations um, what previous councils have said, whether they were last term or three or four years uh, back or 10 years back. So that's my point. So um, I look, look forward to this one coming back in more clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roberts, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I'm one of the old timers. I remember this application um, and, and the reasonings why we put the provisions in place that we did. I could not support what was being presented today. Um, I do have a concern about um, aircraft on our lakes have become um, part of Muskoka, I would say. You know, I, I, if I was just to use an example of, of East Bay, for instance, there's a, a number of, of aircraft that come and go. And, and in fact, people like to see the activity like there's, you know, and there's, there's safe ways of doing things. But I'm, I am very concerned uh, that there was reasons why we put this in place. Those reasons have not changed from what I've seen in this report. Um, and I would not be supporting uh, this coming forward. I'm not sure that a deferral will, will change that for me. It is too large of a dock. And I've always been against people trying to create what others have, uh, what others paid for as well and get charged taxes on um, by trying to create extended docks and that type of thing. If you bought that type of lot, that's what you get. That's my opinion. Thank you. Councillor Burry. So this one uh, hit, hits uh, hits uh, pretty close to home for me, having given up <clears throat> my personal rights uh, in negotiating with a neighbor over boathouse rights uh, and stuff going on title. Um, and then having it come back to a council and thankfully, uh, Councillor Edwards and Councillor Roberts will likely remember the fact that they they said, "Hey, this when they bought the property, it was it was put on and it's got to stay on." Um, you know, I, I, my my concern is um, why is it being recommended for approval out of planning when we see that there was a a negotiation in in past, and and that negotiation neighbors likely gave up rights. Uh, in order to have that negotiation come through. And, and these are the kinds of things that actually made me run and why I'm at the table now. Uh, I, I can probably support a deferral. Um, that being said, uh, you know, it, it, it may change plannings, uh, uh, thoughts on, on, on the, on the piece. And, and I think that, you know, we've, 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 we've got to, we've got to do our homework here. Mr. Pink, would you have any comments on on the the uh, situation about a previous council position and and how that might affect this application? Chair, uh, certainly through you, I think uh, similar to my orientation earlier today, I think this is a good lesson in sort of the reasons for making decisions. I think further to Councillor Roberts' uh, earlier question or request for further information, staff extensively reviewed the historical file. I vaguely recall it myself too. I started here shortly thereafter, and I remember the name because I think it, uh, uh, staff were speaking about it regularly still at the time when I arrived. Um, so it did stir up some discussion amongst the community. However, uh, I don't believe at the time um, uh, staff reports were prepared for consent applications, uh, which would have been more informative, but uh, rest assured current staff uh, thoroughly reviewed the file, the minutes, any reports, uh, notices and could not determine the reason for the prohibition on a boathouse. There's no clear record in the file as to why. Um, we have um, a feeling as to as to why uh, it may have arise, but I don't think we uh, will ever determine. It's not uncommon, however, and I think that's where our gut is leaning, uh, that these things do arise as generally compromises during contentious applications, and that may be what happened here. However, uh, as noted in the orientation, owners have a right to apply and 
we look at the policies in place from the provincial level, district level, and township level. And the issue appears to be surrounding fish habitat. The current application has a qualified professional who has reviewed fish habitat and has indicated there's no concerns with constructing a boathouse on the property. So it becomes a challenge then as a planner or a municipality uh, to make decisions simply because a compromise or a deal uh, was hatched 20 years ago. An application, the applicant has a right to apply and we review the proposal against the policies in place. So it's a good lesson when putting these restrictions both in place and in this case, considering amending those restrictions sometimes years later. Uh, so something to keep in mind, staff's happy to investigate much further into the aerodrome issues. And I think the applicant uh, has requested prudently to defer to uh, do our best to address and respond to the concerns raised by the neighboring property owners. But unfortunately, uh, the records don't seem to shed any light as to exactly why the vote house was uh, uh, prohibited. At least the minutes uh, of the meetings don't seem to uh, make that clear. So fortunately, uh, no YouTube at the time, so not able to rewind the tape and, and watch. So anyway, hopefully that uh, provides some um, helpful information as you continue to deliberate the application. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Councillor Zavitz, then Councillor Edwards. Thank you, and through you, I think to David's to David's points. Um, I mean, I look if I look at uh, Figure Three, there's a large at least. Go ahead, Councillor Zavitz. I, am. I was. Can you hear me now? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, that, that, no, that was me. I I didn't turn. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, I think to to David's uh, to David's point. I mean, I, I look at um, I look at Figure Three, and there's a large blue uh, with white door, at least a triple boathouse, which uh, is coming out into what could be construed to be, I suppose, the entrance to the last of the bay. Uh, so that could be viewed as somewhat restrictive. I, I kind of thought as we as we sit here as a planning committee, you know, we're we're not, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, we're not to contemplate the uses on the water so here's here's an aircraft using the there could be five aircraft using the water there could be 16 boats accessing i mean we we don't have anything to say about that uh in in, in my mind to to an extent uh, to, uh, so i understand being reasonable uh mr niblet of course could sell his property at some point in time and all of a sudden there are no boat no airplanes uh seeking ingress egress from that property I mean, I, I'm, I would be fine with uh, going right, winding this thing right back to what their rights are, which is to the, the sizes as indicated by, um, by our staff, you know, in, in the uh, original recommendation, which is re what's required. Um, given that fish habitat to uh, largely has been addressed, I guess wondering who could answer the question, can, these would these people be satisfied with going, perhaps their planner going back to the minimums? Thank you. Does that get the job done for them? Councillor Edwards. Yes, thank you very much to the chair. Uh, you know, it, it's funny because they're saying it's so shallow, and yet they're saying the property hits spring flooding, which means the water level comes up quite a bit, obviously. And uh, on uh, page uh, 279, it says they've got one meter of water, basically 20 meters out, which is 66 feet, which is more than enough for, for a boat and that. Uh, and I, I can't see why it's extended. I think the, the existing boathouse seems to be out about uh, 69 feet right now. So I end that. And if you look at other pictures in the winter, there's a boat uh, there, which means that they've lowered the level of the water. So I, I would say that we should definitely defer this and that and, and, and that because, and not only that, that's why I've been always saying we should be putting stuff on that title when we make these, because then in the future, they'll know what, what, what was done. Uh, and just because the other council didn't put it on doesn't mean they weren't right. Thank you. Um, one more call for comments, but I, I think we should uh, take a poll straw to, or straw poll rather, to
to find out if everybody's in favor of deferral, in my mind, there's a couple of reasons. One, we've got the issue of the aerodrome. And the other one, which I think is very important, is to give the applicant a chance to speak to their neighbors. And we all know that if, um, if they can work things out with the neighbors, uh, some of our concerns about this may go away. So straw poll on, on uh, allowing the request to deferral. Terrific. So we, we will defer that one. Madam Chair, do I have to do anything other than that? All right. It is now um, 1220, 35. We will come back, break for lunch, and we'll be back at 1.30, if that's all right with everybody else. All right.
We ready? Madam okay. Clerk, let me just see. If the counselors are there, could please turn on their cameras. Thank you very much. Mary Ellen. Sally. Hey, we have quorum. Mr. Zavitz, Mr. Kawa. We're live on YouTube. Okay. Go. All right. Very good. Uh, welcome back. The uh, We have... Uh, no items under zoning bylaw, official plan or site plan, plan of subdivisions of condominiums. Next is we have uh, some very interesting reports coming up. The first one is uh, Director Pink is gonna talk about the uh, implications of Bill 23. Thank you, Chair. Um, as committee members uh, hopefully uh, reviewed, I've prepared a, uh, report on the matter, fairly comprehensive, beginning on page 331 uh, of your agenda packages. And uh, obviously, I, I think probably most of, uh, are somewhat familiar with it, even uh, prior to the report, it's not often uh, that you hear about planning being discussed in the sort of mainstream media and on the, on the streets. And this bill seems to have really uh, stirred up the discussion and, uh, and caused people to talk about uh, the planning process and other environmental type protections. Um, certainly, uh, a uh, number of sweeping changes uh, were proposed. Uh, I won't go into you know, extensive detail. I think the report largely does uh, speak for itself, but I, I'm sure there will be a number of questions and I'll be happy to try to work through those. But I would preface it to say that uh, a lot of the questions I may not be able to answer, we've already uh, reached out to our legal counsel as have many others. And frankly, there's a lot of unanswered questions out there. And the feedback we're getting is a lot of things may just have to work through the court system. Uh, and that's our way of uh, finding some answers to some difficult, uh, difficult questions. But uh, just at a high level, uh, obviously, Bill 23 was uh, given Royal Assent on November 28th. It builds on a number of previous bills that I referred to uh, earlier this morning, all uh, with the premise of, of increasing the housing supply in Ontario. Uh, the timing of the commenting period on the bill was in the middle of the uh, municipal election period. So obviously council uh, and committee wasn't meeting. Uh, so staff, uh, the uh, directors across Muskoka, we uh, we met and uh, worked together to um, come up with a submission to the province uh, on behalf of, um, uh, again, the planning directors across uh, Muskoka. Uh, the district of Muskoka uh, did meet and endorse uh, that submission. So it was sent to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. There is a link in your report uh, to that submission. Uh, unfortunately, um, really all the comments or the concerns that we raised uh, didn't result in any any changes to the uh, legislation. Um, again, from a high level, the this bill and the ones um, preceding it really are built around, uh, again, solving the affordable housing or the housing crisis in general. Um, in my opinion, for what it's it's worth, I don't think the, the bill really will achieve that objective. Uh, really what it's doing is weakening some of the development approvals process, as opposed to really looking at the, the root issues and working with partners and, and trying to solve uh, the problem. Um, really in the district of Muskoka, there's an extensive amount of draft approved uh, units. And uh, as I noted in the report, really the largest or the most common, sorry, planning application that the district receives is extending that draft approval as opposed to getting shovels in the ground. So um, time will tell, I, you know, it is certainly an admirable goal and uh, there are some measures in the bill that uh, uh, certainly may be, assist, uh, you know, may be assistance in, in that crisis. But I think at a whole, I don't think the development approvals process, at least in Muskoka, is really the, the root of the issue. Our uh, planning act timelines of processing applications are much quicker than uh, some larger urban settings. So unfortunately, the, the brunt of the report really goes into some of the potentially unintended consequences uh, of the bill. And really the, the first one, the main one, that I'm sure we'll talk about the most is with respect to site plan control. Uh, as those returning councillors know, really the new official plan relied heavily on implementing a lot of the policies and measures that we look to uh, uh, instill uh, through the site plan process. And the bill uh, removes our authority or ability to 
um, impose that process unless the development is either commercial in nature or more than 10 residential units, which obviously is not uh, an overly common application uh, in the township. Um, so as, uh, as I've noted in the report, uh, really what I foresee um, in some respects, I guess it's fortuitous timing. We did recently adopt um, a new official plan. As I've noted in the orientation, we will have to uh, update our zoning bylaw. And one of the uh, avenues or tools available to us is what's called a community planning permit system. And through that process, what it essentially does is roll up into one process or sort of a one window approach, uh, the zoning bylaw amendment, minor variance, and site plan approval processes all into one and property owners are issued a, a community planning permit. And I don't know if the province intentionally uh, omitted that process from the bill uh, or whether it was an attempt to actually steer municipalities to that new tool. Uh, however, for now, um, if we can get that new bylaw in place, it would um, largely address the, the gap uh, that we may have for the short period where site plan control is not able to, uh, uh, to be imposed. Um, the, I think we've talked about this, uh, I think already yesterday, but uh, Bill 23, again, will still be, uh, will still allow commercial development to be subject to site plan control, but it's noted that exterior design uh, will no longer be a feature uh, that we can regulate or debate uh, through that process. Uh, would also note, uh, again, staff struggling to wrap our head around all the changes and we're trying to adapt as quickly as possible. Uh, for those members involved with committee of adjustment, you'll, uh, you'll notice quite often uh, minor variances are approved uh, conditional on a site plan agreement being entered into. Um, again, thankfully, there is another tool under the Planning Act um, Call different things, whether it's a development agreement or a minor variance agreement, but section 45, uh, subsection 9.1 does allow the municipality or committee of adjustment to impose an agreement registered on title, so virtually identical to a site plan uh, on minor variance, excuse me, approvals. So staff has already uh, this round started recommending those agreements as conditions in lieu of uh, site plan. You'll notice the, the ultimate recommendation of the report, it's largely an informational report, uh, however, uh, I am recommending that our fee bylaw uh, be amended uh, so that uh, the township collects a fee for that process, as it is similar to the site plan process. Uh, it wasn't commonly utilized because everything was imposed through site plan, so I am recommending uh, a fee for that process, um, and that will recoup uh, some of the lost revenue from, uh, from not being able to impose site plan control. Um, I would also note, and you might have seen this earlier on today's agenda with, uh, with an application or two, many times with zoning amendments, um, uh, dissimilar to minor variances, we're not able to impose conditions. Um, but often we would recommend approval subject to uh, the property being subject to site plan control. As that implementation tool is no longer available, you may see staff may no longer be able to recommend approval of uh, certain zoning bylaw amendment applications. You're left with essentially uh, trust or a, a verbal promise that an applicant will, you know, fulfill the obligations of technical studies or will revegetate their shoreline, and that uh, may be a challenge for the municipality to accept. and uh, And staff may struggle recommending approval with the loss of uh, of that tool. Um, so, uh, as I said, the uh, community planning permit system is thankfully for the time being. Uh, you know, a suitable change that uh, should address uh, that concern, um, but it will take some time for the municipality to work through that zoning by law review process and get that uh, uh, that new system in place. It does speak to the importance of previous term of council updating our tree preservation and site alteration bylaws. So rest assured those are still in place. And if property owners undertake certain uh, activities along the shoreline, those tools are still in place to uh, uh, protect that act, uh, against that activity. Um, again, a number of other changes, and again, I'll, I'll just quickly highlight a, a few of these and, and leave it to uh, two questions. Uh, but with respect to plans of subdivision, they've removed the requirement to, to hold a public meeting through that process. Obviously, that's a requirement that uh, uh, the district regularly, you know, uh, I, I think the community found valuable to be able to provide input into that process. Um, 
uh, other changes with respect to what uh, Romans I think is referring to as gentle density. Um, any zoning bylaw that uh, does not permit uh, urban residential land uh, to permit up to three residential use uh, residential units is no longer of any effect, which essentially means that any uh, property owner in Port Carling or Bala residentially uh, zoned is able to have up to three uh, residential units, um, either within an ancillary building uh, or within the main structure. As we talked about this morning in the orientation, the bill has removed a number of third party appeals in particular to minor variances and consents decisions. So again, uh, the applicant or the property owner can still appeal. Uh, however, neighboring property owners would no longer be able to. Fairly significant changes to the Ontario uh, Land Tribunal Act. Um, now, and it's really unclear whether uh, the tribunal will act on this, but in the past, you really need, uh, in order to be awarded costs, you needed to meet a threshold of unreasonable, frivolous, or vexatious or bad faith behavior. Um, but however, the, the changes now uh, allow uh, the winning party to uh, basically awarded costs uh, to the losing party. And again, it's um, unclear at this time uh, if tribunal members will act on that and how vigorously, but that potentially could put a chill on the number of uh, appeals or, um, you know, um, certain individuals uh, wanting to engage in that part of the planning process, it certainly will uh, cause them to pause uh, and seriously think that uh, think that through. There's a number of changes to the Development Charges Act as well. Um, perhaps a little less impactful on us. It's a phase in and an extension from every five to ten years that we need to update the development charges uh, bylaw, and it does exempt uh, certain types of developments for affordable and attainable residential units. Uh, again, unfortunately, we don't see a significant amount of that development. So uh, as much as there is some uh, reduction in overall revenue, um, it, uh, it hopefully won't be too significant for the township. Uh, I would uh, like to highlight, lastly, um, some changes to the Heritage Act. Uh, we haven't really talked about that yet in this term, obviously, and some uh, pretty notable amendments to the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, we There's a two uh, types of, um, I guess, measures to put in place under that act that municipality can use to protect um, heritage properties or, or properties or buildings that may be of uh, cultural or heritage significance. And one is a general list or a register, and there's no uh, real significant process to be put on that list. And all it does is um, allow the municipality really 60 days of pause should an owner wish to demolish a building and it allows the municipality to review that and potentially take action should that demolition not be desirous. Uh, there's also uh, designation of properties. We've, I believe, uh, don't quote me on this number, but I think we have 11, 12 or 13 properties designated in the township. I don't believe there's any significant changes there. However, we have about 77 properties on our register or list. Uh, under these changes, and they haven't uh, the transitioned there and yet to come into force, uh, but they presumably will shortly, the municipality will have two years in which to either designate those 77 properties or they be or they will be removed from the register. Um, currently, there's certainly no either staff or financial resources to even really scratch the surface of those 77 properties and begin designation designation process for them, if so desired. Uh, but if a heritage committee is established, staff suggesting that uh, that be one of their immediate tasks is really starting to look at that register and identifying uh, those properties that should uh, receive some added protection as in two years, it essentially will all be uh, lost. Uh, so lastly, as I noted, and I think this will come up through the budget process, I believe it was raised by our treasurer yesterday. Um, one of the most significant changes again is the removal for our ability for site plan approval, uh, really for essentially all, uh, you know, the vast majority of development that we experience. Um, year to date in 2022, and we're not uh, uh, full 12 months yet. It's uh, We've received over $150,000 in revenue from the site plan process. That essentially now is gone um, through the uh, staff recommendation to uh, recoup some of the fees for minor variance agreements. Uh, we may recoup uh, a small percentage uh, of that. Uh, and again, but if a community planning permit uh, system bylaw is established, we can certainly look at our fees through that process and uh, and recoup uh, any lost fees. So I think uh, I've gone on long enough. I will 
uh, leave it at that and uh, I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Director Pink. Uh, we have two questions up already. Uh, Councillor Zavitz. Uh, thank you through you to David. Uh, and David, thanks for some of these initial observations. I wonder if you might opine for just a few moments on how or what, how will Bill 23 affect our planning meetings? What will we notice as uh, subtle fundamental changes to our planning meetings? This is like no delegations or less delegations, less neighbors involved, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, uh, through the chair. It's obviously it's early times and it's hard to tell definitively, but you may find actually fairly minimal changes to the actual day-to-day -day, uh, planning committee meeting. Uh, Bill 109, which was passed earlier this year, uh, already required the delegation of site plan approval applications to staff. So in the past, uh, commercial or major development would have come before committee, uh, site plan approval of commercial or major development. And those would be matters on your agenda. Uh, you won't see those anymore. Uh, but your uh, typical applications, your zoning bylaw amendments, your consent applications, official plan amendments, they will come before committee. We'll still hear as we did this morning, those for and against and have good debate and discussion and make recommendations on those bylaws in the bill. I don't think will change that. I think the community should still hopefully continue to be engaged in our applications. Um, where you may see a bit of a change is again, uh, the appeal rights after. I think parties need to really think seriously about their, uh, you know, their positions and the likelihood of success before submitting appeals as if they're not successful. Uh, it can be fairly substantial cost to not only cover your own expenses, but now potentially of the other party or parties. Uh, so that could potentially, again, cause uh, applicants some uh, sober second thought before um, uh, submitting appeals, but not really part of the, I guess, our committee day-to-day -day process. I think actually that may, other than the removal of commercial site plans, uh, should largely be the same. Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Through you to David, I'm. I guess I'm trying to understand where the six hundred dollars came from. So, are we? Is it legislated that that's the most that we can charge? Um. Like, yeah, I do, I just I wonder. It's significantly less than usually a site plan application. So. Under the legislation, uh, fees for planning processes should just cover the reasonable costs of processing the applications. They're not intended to make a profit or be a revenue generator necessarily that way. Um, what uh, we've done uh, for quite some time in the fee bylaw is site plans that are a condition of a zoning or a minor variance approval are 50% of the site plan fee. So the site plan fee is $1,200. But when they're a condition of approval, we've taken 600. And the reasoning for that is staff have already visited the property. They've already reviewed the development. So it's quite, it should be an abbreviated or more efficient process to really just consider the conditions that committee of adjustment or council wanted to see through that site plan, whether it's additional plantings, stormwater management, uh, control on lighting, et cetera. So we don't have to duplicate the site visit. We don't have to review the development again. So we do take 50%, which is the $600. And that's why I've recommended that amount. With that said, it's not an exact science. Um, I'll be honest with you, some applicants we should charge considerably more and then others $600 uh, might be more than uh, really the staff time. It's very variable depending on the type of application. So I think there is a little bit of flexibility there should council feel 600 is not the right number. I think you have some discretion there to um, uh, to add or subtract uh, some you know a modest amount if you feel that's necessary. But six hundred dollars seems uh, to reasonably recover the staff time on a typical um, conditional agreement process when you consider. And sorry to go on, but I think the last thing I would know. Keep in mind that also includes registration on title. The municipality does have staff with TerraView licenses. We do register on title. I believe the current fee is about eighty dollars. Uh, per registration. Um, so it includes those costs as well. The municipality includes that as part of the uh, the fees. Chair Kent, may, may I further? Roberts. 
sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, so I get to my question here. Um, thank you, Director Pink. Um, can you explain on, on page 336, uh, you discuss parkland uh, dedication. And at the end of it, it says the change that 60% of the parkland reserve fund now needs to be spent at the beginning of the year. Can you elaborate on that, please? And then I have another question. Certainly uh, through the chair and, and thank you for that. I, I, I think I missed that uh, section of the report going through uh, my introduction. Uh, it is a notable change. And uh, essentially it's, it's as you've stated, uh, currently there's no requirement. We do collect a healthy amount of parkland fees through our consent application process. Uh, through Typically we take cash uh, at the municipality. Usually what we see for consent applications is just one lot, maybe two or three lot creation. And it's not really feasible to take the actual park land itself. We would end up with numerous small fragments of land throughout the municipality. So we do commonly take 5% of the assessed value of these newly created lots. And as you can imagine with our land values in the township, it's a fairly substantial amount. Currently there's, it goes into reserve. It is, um, and the treasurer I don't think is on the meeting, but um, they're going to reserve where it's limited as to what we can uh, utilize it for. It has specifically be on parkland or recreational uses. Uh, however, there's no timing around when you can spend it. So typically, and this is a concern that I think was raised by a number of municipalities uh, through Bill, the Bill 23 process. I think it's prudent to really plan your future expenditures and, and parkland uh, acquisition uh, through such things as the Parks and Trails Master Plan. And it takes some time to build up the appropriate funds and acquire, you know, identify the appropriate properties in order to uh, grow our parkland. Uh, under these changes, we will be required to spend uh, annually 60% uh, of that reserve. Uh, now, fortunately, um, the definition of what we can spend it on is somewhat broad in general. It's any recreational type purposes. So I think uh, potentially any upgrades or um, uh, improvements to our existing parks and community centers may be able to be used, which may assist. Uh, but this will certainly be a challenge and I look forward to working with the treasurer who can probably speak to it much uh, better than I, but I'm sure we'll be working closely together through budget time to uh, identify where those funds can and should be used on an annual basis. Um, but it is a fairly healthy reserve currently, and we will have to utilize uh, those funds uh, more uh, promptly going forward. Yeah, uh, thank you. A supplemental uh, chair, please, on this. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, and it, it, it could be a, a, a sort of a mandate for the um, recreation committee for next term to to figure this out to figure or make some recommendations the only other one i have as a comment is that um for the um, um community planning permit system um i would think uh, you would probably given that what you just said you'd be bringing that back as a budget item to implement that is that am i correct uh, through the chair, uh, what uh, what I believe I noted is uh, the beginning of that project uh, will start or staff suggesting in 2023. And I believe it's in your 10 year capital plan. The majority of the spending will be in 2024 and 2025. But uh, once the budget is approved, the intention is to start the community planning, uh, basically the review of our zoning bylaw in, in probably mid to late uh, 2023. So there are some funds in your um, uh, slated for that in your 2023 budget that you'll be reviewing shortly uh, to commence that process. Uh, and then also once that bylaw, if it is approved and once it's in place, we could look at the fees that were lost through site plan and try to recoup those um, uh, and amend our tariff of fee bylaw to charge obviously a larger fee where someone has to go through a zoning and site plan process all rolled into one through this community planning permit system. So we can certainly look at our fee bylaw once that bylaw is in place. So sorry for the sort of rambling answer, but uh, really to start, there Thank are uh, we will have to expend funds to update the bylaw. That's first in your budget. And then we can look at fees once that bylaw is in place. Councilor Nishikawa, do you have a question? Your hand is up.
Sorry, no, I, I wanted to, to uh, ask a further question from my, my last one. Not it, it was in relationship to David, but it, we're off on to different topics now. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Ross, and that's through the chair. Uh, David, so if we take securities for plantings now and we're not allowed to, how can we, we, we get securities uh, through the uh, community planning permit uh, system or uh, just what? For those uh, through the chair, uh, where the committee of adjustment recommends uh, condition of the agreement that we're suggesting a fee be charged for. I believe through that agreement, we can take security. So that process largely remains unchanged. But unfortunately, um, if council and deliberating a zoning bylaw amendment, as we heard perhaps earlier this morning, uh, you know, is desirous of seeing trees planted, one potential option is really requiring those trees to be planted up front and come back to you uh, because you would no longer have an ability to take a security or anything more than a verbal promise from the applicant that they'll do it. Once the approval is given, there'd be no more authority for the township to ensure it's actually completed. So you may have to consider from time to time actually seeing the work done up front. And I think actually one of the applicant's agents this morning suggested that approach. Um, we could do the work and come back. It might cause a lot of deferrals. Uh, there's an interesting nuance that I believe I referred to it in the report or in my orientation. Uh, the earlier bill, Bill 109, actually requires the municipality to refund application fees uh, should certain timelines under the Planning Act not be met. If we're deferring for plannings to be done, we're essentially going to have to refund everyone's planning application fees. So um, can't seem to win uh, either route. But um, essentially, to answer your question, the ability to take securities uh, where just the site plan approval process was in play is, is essentially now lost. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mazin. Thank you. And through you, uh, Chair Hosmerth. Um, a great report. So uh, there's a lot to absorb in this. And I may be repeating something that you've already asked or been talking about. I'm trying to understand our community planning permit system. And I know that you've touched upon it here moving forward. Is this a, will we be receiving a more comprehensive report moving forward? Is that what you said or, okay. Sorry, through you chair. <laughs> Sorry, uh, through the chair. No, definitely um, really my, the current report for you is really just scratches the surface at, at best of that issue. If council's desires and in, in the new official plan, the adopted official plan, it's laid the groundwork to uh, implement such a system. There will be a lot of additional information reports as we go through. I think really it will probably start with um, uh, the request for proposals for a consultant to do our new zoning bylaw. We'll likely include in that, um, you know, that uh, looking into that system and staff, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll bring future reports on the system in much more detail as to the pros and cons of it and the various uh, iterations and options that you have before you. This is really just in relation to Bill 23 and, and again, not a silver lining, but uh, perhaps the one glimmer of hope that yes, site plan is lost, but there is another tool there where we can recoup that uh, important tool. It just might take us, uh, you know, a year or two or three to, to get that in place. It's complicated. Thank you. And for you, just a quick supplemental. Yeah, sorry. That's okay, thank you. Um, so for today, I see the recommendation is simply to try and give you some tools and try and offset some of the costs potentially lost in site plan approval for an agreement. The rest of this is just foundational <laughs> information for us, but we will be having many touch points on this. Is that, it, that was the intention of today's reporting. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um... Director Pink, I have one. The it has to rate to do with the the seventy seven uh, items on the heritage list. Uh, I don't know anything about that, so if you just give me a minute or two of what what does it involve to, to take somebody on the list and make it actually a heritage building or a heritage designation? I guess. Excellent question. Um, so through you, um, the 
process uh, essentially is um, fairly involved. It's similar to, I guess, a planning application in that uh, first, the property needs to be identified that it meets certain criteria under the Heritage Act. I think there's four, three or four uh, criteria where it meets the, the value to be designated. And if that background research is done on the property or the buildings and it's determined that it meets that criteria, uh, the municipality is required to advertise that. So there is, um, I think, a broader advertising uh, in a local newspaper and, uh, and to immediate neighbors. A public meeting is held, similar to a zoning application or a minor variance. And then should council pass a bylaw, uh, the difference between being on the register is a simply a pause on demolition. But if designated, the bylaw will actually list the criteria that you want to preserve. It's very detailed. So it might say, you know, this chimney or a front porch uh, or a building, um, you know, the Windermere house itself, a view from the water. That's what we're preserving. And then if passed, it is registered. Uh, and um, basically it's binding on future owners and those attributes would no longer be able to be impacted. So um, again, zoning changes or building permits would not be able to be issued if it negatively impacts those attributes. Uh, property owners still have the ability to come before council and ask for uh, relief if needed, but it, uh, it does in a very detailed way uh, protect uh, those attributes. So I think it's quite common for municipalities to have this list because it's quite easy to get on. Uh, it just has to, we just think there may be value here. So we'll put you on a list. There's no great uh, burden to the owner. Um, so we put you on that placeholder. And what Bill 23 does is now really remove that uh, altogether or in two years. Um, so it really forces municipalities to say, well, this is either a property we truly want to protect and put the resources into identifying those attributes and protecting them. Um, it's really eliminating the list altogether, uh, essentially. So I hope that helps. And, and is there, there's no extended timeline to work through your opening backlog? Then? No, other than that portion of the bill has not been proclaimed yet. So it's not in effect just as yet. I don't believe the province released when it may be. So we're getting two years plus every day that goes by. Um, but again, it could be proclaimed at any moment and, and the two-year clock starts ticking, so. Mayor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you, I just wanna follow up on that last comment uh, uh, with Mr. Pink. So does the list actually go away and we don't, we can't add back to the list? Um, because obviously the question I have, I mean, two years, we haven't had them designated. Uh, can we not just put them back on the list if they, after they've been kicked off? Or does the list disappear altogether? Thank you. Okay. The chair, um, I'd have to, to be definitive, uh, go over the bill in detail. As I said, we're still trying to digest, but from what I understand or from what I recall of reading that change is once the property is on it and is then removed, it's not able to go back on. You can still add different properties. So if we identify a, a, one of the properties that are not of the 77, we could still add them and then they will get two years, but you once off, you wouldn't be able to put back on. Too easy a loophole probably for the province to uh, <laughs> not caught that one. Councillor Moyer-Kent. Okay, thank you and through you. I have two quick questions. Um, one is how did the 77 properties get on that list? Were they designated by the homeowner by, or by somebody else in the community? And, and, that, and the second question, if you, you want me to do that first, was sure. the, and this is maybe just, I wasn't clear from your comments. Uh, this is to Mr. Pink. Were the fees, that we're gonna lose fees from site plan control almost immediately, effectively. But it sounds to me like we are not going to be able to recoup fees from the CPPS system for multiple years. And I was wondering if you could just give me an impact, unless I'm misinterpreting that, of how much that might be over the next year, in each of the next year or two budgets. Let's say we don't implement it for two years. Mr. Pink. Thank you. Uh, so through the chair, um, this is uh, going quite a bit back, but the municipality has the authority to add properties to the list or not. And uh, for the relatively recent uh, past, it's been referred to as a heritage committee. 
Uh, prior to that, uh, Councillor Nishikawa probably recalls it was a uh, LACAC committee, Local Architectural Conservancy, um, something, something. And it was uh, established by the municipality. They went out and actually looked at uh, an extensive amount of properties in the township, did, uh, did site visits. There's very brief uh, files uh, actually housed in the municipality on um, those properties. And they suggested to council that those properties be added to a list to preserve them. I think it would have been early 2000s or late 90s. And it was when I believe at that time the Heritage Act was amended to allow that tool. So a committee was established, went out, uh, looked at the properties and council agreed to put uh, those on the list. Uh, to your second question on the fees, uh, it is noted in the uh, financial section of the report. Obviously the, the amount of revenue on site plan fluctuates somewhat year to year, but to give you an example in 2022, it was 100, north of 150,000 to 000, date yeah. that will be lost. And depending on the number of conditions that the minor variance uh, or that the committee of adjustment would oppose on minor variances, we may recoup anywhere from 15 to 25, I'm estimating, um, given your an average year uh, through the uh, just the conditions of approval uh, and that fee. I should also note, um, uh, again, it is in the report, but I, I should perhaps just briefly highlight it just so that committee's aware, council is aware of how uh, the municipality will deal with this. I think it's a reasonable approach and we have uh, consulted with our solicitor on it. There are a number of previous approvals which uh, were granted by the committee of adjustment and council conditional on site plan approval. If those property owners hadn't acted yet, and many people take some time to do so, um, really it could be argued that they can't meet the condition and they'd have to reapply and go through. That did not seem like a reasonable approach to our solicitor. So uh, just so that council's aware, we will be accepting this uh, 45 sub 91 agreement as meeting the intent of the committee of adjustment and fulfilling that condition. It is essentially uh, the same thing. So I wanted uh, council to be aware uh, of, uh, of that approach. Unmute. How's that? Okay, Councilor Nishikawa. Uh, further, what David was saying about the Heritage Act and those issues, um, David, I'm 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 a little concerned um, that even in in the term of the 2010 and 2014. And certainly, yes, for many, many years, I have been involved with heritage, along with actually um, many community citizens and, and that have expertise in this. Um, so we actually approved, and I'm, I'm thinking about a couple of, I, I can't quite remember if they were island properties, but they were quite prominent um, heritage looking boathouses and, and, and different things. And we gave extended uh, property rights or building rights based on them being registered under the Heritage Act and, and maintaining that heritage uh, piece because that was an important part of the story that Muskoka tells. And it, it is about our story about Muskoka. Um, it's, it's not any different than them trying to go and tear down Queens Park. Uh, where, where is a historic, you know, place. So I, I just, I'm, I'm not sure what we're going to do, or, or perhaps some of those properties we could look into further. I'm not, I'm not sure what the mayor's plans about heritage are, but um, I would hate for those applications to now come forward and, um, and remove some of those, those pieces. Uh, that we deemed important to Muskoka. Um, and, and now that ability that we put in place is wiped away. Go ahead. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, I'm, I'm not sure what else to add other than I, I share your concern. Uh, like I said, it's uh, a number of changes to these bills, and uh, I think I recall the the development or the um, agreement we entered into at that particular property on preserving, uh, you know, features of the property as a condition of approval, and that's I think speaks to some of the challenges, as I noted, that uh, staff may not be able to make certain recommendations to council uh, anymore if if we've lost tools to really require certain things to uh, to be implemented. Uh, again, I guess, fortunately with Heritage, unlike site plan control, that process is gone. We've already started returning applications that were in the queue and already uh, mid process. We received legal advice that uh, the transition is such that uh, even ones that went through 90% to date, but didn't, uh, didn't get the final approval uh, are being returned. Thankfully, I guess with Heritage, the tool is still there. We can still designate. Um, but the heritage uh, register is, is just going to be an abbreviated or a really weakened tool. Um, so, uh, but I, again, I'm not sure what else to add other than I share your concern with that and a number of changes to this bill. I'm hopeful the province hears. Um, again, I'm sure we all hear on the radio. So let's say people complaining about certain changes and I hope the province is listening, but uh, um, I think unfortunately we're left, uh, left with hope. Councillor Burry. So the the just for for everyone's you know context and and everyone should know that I live with a heritage nerd, um, and that's a that's a, a good thing. Um, the the neat thing about about uh, having them on a register is that a a, a landowner uh, couldn't demolish. So it what it it did is it bought the township some time to actually really figure out okay do we let this demolition happen or or do we do we designate so it was it was a really neat tool that 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 david and 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 the folks within the township had to be able to say no you don't get a demolition permit and we can come out and take a look and it really gave the township you know 30 45 days i forget exactly what it was um to that they didn't have to uh issue a demolition permit or 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 a building permit for that matter um and that's the piece that that we're going to lose and um you know having visited many of those 77 uh sites over the period of time especially if they were water access only and uh someone needs a boat driver um we we would you know you you would see that there was really neat things there and and um not every homeowner understands what a designation means. It doesn't mean you can't do anything. It means that there are parts of your building or parts of the property that you can't do things with. Um, the city of Toronto has done a fantastic job with, with parts of it. Um, and, and there are buildings where it's not the whole building that's designated, it's the library or the wood paneling in the, in the, in the front foyer. And and um, I mean it's it's complicated for sure, and I'm I am not the expert, but I I do think that you know losing the register is is a is probably a big deal for us, because we are going to lose some properties. We're not going to be able to move fast enough, and and we're going to have people come in and say, well, it's not there anymore. I can get a demolition permit, and off we go. And I, I hope I phrased that more or less correctly for you, for, for David, just for us lay people. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? If not, we'll move on to the next uh, item on the agenda. And that item is a report on pre-consultation bylaw. And Mr. Sharp is our presenter. Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bosomworth. Uh, for committee's consideration, I've prepared a draft bylaw requiring mandatory pre-consultations for certain applications submitted under the Planning Act, including zoning bylaw amendment applications and applications for site plan approval. <clears throat> Pre-consultation is an important uh, part of the planning process, as we know, allowing opportunity for application requirements to be discussed in advance of submission. Staff sense that pre-consultations are occurring uh, less frequently than prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is causing numerous incomplete applications, delay and a strain on staff resources. Uh, changes to the Planning Act 
uh, set to take effect on January 1st, 2023. As Mr. Pink had noted, will require fees processed for zoning bylaw amendment applications and applications for site plan approval to be refunded if no decision or approval is issued within, certain, within a certain number of days. Uh, these changes underscore the importance of complete application submissions. It is quite common, uh, as I believe Mr. Pink had noted uh, already in this meeting, um, for municipalities to have a bylaw requiring mandatory pre-consultations for these types of applications. And uh, myself and Mr. Pink both feel that the time is right uh, for this to occur in the township. I would note that there is no legislative authority under the Planning Act to require mandatory pre-consultations for minor variants or consent applications, which account for a considerable volume of the Planning Division's application intake. Staff will continue to um, highly recommend that pre-consultations occur prior to submitting these types of applications. Um, I would note that there are two small errors in the draft bylaw identifying sections 3.1 and 3.3. Um, the correct references should be to sections 2.1 and 2.3, and I regret any confusion that this may have caused. The draft bylaw will be revised to correct these typographical errors if approved and prior to signing by the mayor and clerk. I have no further comments at this time, and I'd be happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Mr. Pink. Um, committee, it appears we had a resolution with the last uh, presentation from Director Pink uh, that I'd like to pass now. Everybody all right with that? Um, moved by Councillor Mazin, seconded by Councillor Zavitz. Be it re resolved, the Planning Committee recommends to the Township Council by Zoning Bylaw Amendment application. Is this the right one? No, you're not. No, no. Eight, eight, eight. Didn't sound right. Try this again. Moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved that the Planning Committee recommends to Township Council the transfer F, the Schedule F of transfer of fee bylaw 2022-152, the amendment to remove fees related to single unit residential site plan agreements and to add a fee of $600 for agreements pursuant to section 45 bracket 9.1 of the Planning Act. All those in favor? Any against? So carried. Right. Uh, sorry. Any questions to Mr. Sharp? Council Mazin. Thank you. And through you, Hi, Chair. Uh, to Mr. Sharp, um, a question. I, I'm looking at your appendix, the actual pre consultation form. And going down to the, the notes section, and I see the, the second note, and I'll just read it out for, help, for helpful purposes, about the land within the 50 feet of a shoreline shall remain in a natural state for site alteration by law and tree preservation by law. Um, what I think could be very helpful at this stage, if this is going to be a mandatory piece, and it's our first point of contact, in the development process is to have that in a more illustrative way uh, to kind of create more impact. So, it, you know, I know there's a lot of resources that are out there, 
I know that we have also added resources internally to try and help in this matter, but just wondering if you have some thoughts on how we could add to this document um, and ensure that not only the people who are building in the consultation phase, so if it's a planner, but also that the applicant themselves has been able to see this and review it. Through you, Chair Bosomworth, and thank you for your uh, suggestion, Councillor Mazen. Um, I think it's an excellent uh, suggestion. The appendices to the pre-consultation bylaws intended to be a living document. In other words, um, the bylaw is written such that we can adjust it, make additions, take things away as we see fit without having to come back to, uh, to Council to have those amendments approved. So certainly, just thinking off the top of my head, certainly we could consider um, providing, you know, useful links that we feel uh, would be of, of some assistance uh, in collaboration with our um, uh, communications uh, um, specialist. And, you know, we could also consider perhaps putting together, um, you know, some type of information package for applicants um, when they are pre-consulting with us. Um, that may extend beyond just what uh, you know the township requires so far as the zoning bylaw and official plan um, speaks like I'm, uh, I'm just thinking again off the top of my head but something maybe like the love love your lake program or um, just informational pieces like that so you know I'd be happy to uh, to discuss that in, in further detail um, offline with you if you think that that would be would be helpful Councillor Mazin. Sorry, that's a bit of a process, isn't it? <laughs> Thank uh -huh. you, and through you, just a supplemental. Um, I do think that, I mean, if this is our first point of contact and you're going through this checklist, uh, as we see in many of these applications, it's often the planner who's doing the application and will probably go through this form, which I think is great. And I think this, pro this process is really helpful. Um, but we know that there are certain things that have been quite important to us. And I'm, I really feel that if there's a way for us to kind of start weaving in some of this ed educational element up front um, and embedding it in the process, I think that would be very helpful. So while links are good, I do think a very visual impact as a starting point could be very helpful. The second part, and I think this is more the supplemental part of my question, is, um, is in this process, is it uh, practice that the applicant as well as the planner needs to be a part of this pre-consultation and to sign off on things? Or is it simply, and this is a question for staff, I don't know the answer to this, or is it typically handled with just the planner? Mr. Sharp. Uh, you, Chair Bosomworth. You know, typically a pre-consultation involves you know, the planner that will be responsible for handling the application. And it may involve the applicant or the applicant's agents or both. Um, in some cases, I may be in attendance or the township senior planner may be in attendance to, uh, you know, to sit in and, and provide assistance as, as needed. But the appendices that we've created uh, to this bylaw would be intended to be filled out um, during or shortly after the pre-consultation meeting and it would be kept on record uh, by staff and a copy would be provided to the applicant and or their agent. And when the application is submitted, um, the application would be reviewed against um, this checklist. And, you know, staff would use that to guide um, or be of some assistance in deeming the application complete under the requirements of the, the Planning Act. So it's sort of a, a bit of a feedback loop. So just a, so I, this would be my, I'm sorry, thank you. It, it, with your permission, can I just ask one more question mm -hmm. on clarifying yeah. on that? Um, so my clarifying question, I, I guess, is, is there an opportunity, and, and if it's not an answer right today, to consider at the beginning stage of a pre-consultation process, maybe putting some importance on having both the planning app uh, agent as well as the applicant, as well as somebody from the township as part of that initial consultation, which would allow for an understanding that's shared amongst all parties. So again, I, that's a repeat, I know, but I do think that there 
there, it, it's something to consider uh, in this process. So thank you. Just one supplemental, if I may, uh, Chair. Yes, go ahead, please. Failed to mention that uh, a lot of our pre-consultations do involve, um, you know, collabor a collaborative effort with other um, departments within the township. So, you know, maybe the chief building official, maybe Chief Morrell from the uh, fire uh, emergency services, it may be um, Mr. Becking or Mr. Sopko from public works, um, district staff may be involved depending on, you um, the specifics of any given proposal. So there definitely are, uh, you know, it's a definitely a collaborative effort and, and you know, it will continue to be. Thank you. I might just add that um, I, we have schematics in our uh, dark sky bylaw and they are very useful. And I've seen schematics in other jurisdictions uh, with respect to land use, and they they are uh, they get the message across very effectively. Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you, and that's uh, to the chair. Um, I think it's really good having the uh, pre consultations, and you know what's really upsetting is we have professional planners that come in with applications, and we we get notes all the time, not shown on drawing, not shown on drawing. There should be some sort of a penalty because they are told when they uh, come in, they have to put everything on it. And it was even one not today where a pump house wasn't shown or, or something else like that. I think we should be really going after them and say it's not complete. And, uh, you know, whether you have to come back or what, I don't know. But it, it's very, very annoying. It, it's different if the, if the owner is putting it in and they don't know. But our, our planning uh, and that consultants that are here know better. And they, they, they should be making sure that everything is on those wrongs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Um, I have one question for Mr. Sharp, and that is, I presume that the, uh, the legislation in respect to reducing the amount or returning the amount of fees for slower processing doesn't start until the application comes in. It would not start at the pre-consultation time, obviously. Just looking for confirmation. That is that is correct, yes. Um, it, it, it remains to see to be seen exactly uh, how that how that works. I, I have some reading uh, to do with respect to you know the timelines, but so far as I can tell, I think that the um, the 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 clock essentially starts clicking um, or ticking um, uh, on the day that the, the application is deemed complete by the municipality. So. Thank you very much. One last chance for further questions from the committee. I seeing none. I believe I have a bylaw to be read here. Clerk, Madam Clerk. Yeah. And that is 8B. Seconded by Councillor Burry. Sorry, moved by Councillor Burry, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved that the Planning Committee recommends to Township Council that bylaw 2022-199 pre-planning pre-consultation bylaw be given three readings. All those in favor? Uh, a question before we... Uh, Councillor Mazin? Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, uh, just a clarifying question then. Uh, any of those amendments or discussions we just had about the actual document themselves, would those be just, we can pass this by law and those kind of amendments can come back to us as council to the actual uh, appendix? I just wanted clarification from Mr. Stewart. I think that's what I heard him say is that it's a, a bit of a living document. I think I think he you said this. that the attachments, the appendix was a living document. Maybe uh, Mr. Sharp could clarify. Thank you, Chair Bosenworth. Uh, ultimately, you know, I'm at the will of uh, planning committee here. If if you would like to see 
the appendices return with the changes that we've discussed, specifically the links being some, some additional links being provided. We're happy to do that uh, when the matter returns to council in January. Alternatively, as I had indicated, we, we can just go ahead and make those changes uh, to the appendices after uh, the bylaw has been approved by council. Um, it's, it's written that way that we're able to do that. So I'm happy to do either or, it's ultimately up to uh, what planning committee would prefer. Uh, would the preference from the committee be to see it uh, when it comes to council? Just general. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nishikawa. Well, sorry, I, I prefer the, the second uh, comment that Bryce had made. I don't believe that it needs to come back to council the next round. I, I think that's a, an item that might take up too much time. And, and in fact, um, it's already gonna be taken care of. So I don't, I don't need it to come to council next time. General nod of heads on that. Fair enough. All right. So I've read the motion. Um, all those in favor? Any opposed? Yes, yeah, so we have nothing under Heritage or Development Services, and we are now going to get a report from uh, Rob Kennedy on setting fines for the site alteration and tree conservation bylaws. Mr. Kennedy. Uh, good afternoon, committee. Uh, this is more of an informational report. Uh, as you or the um, people that were on the former council are aware, we just passed the new site alteration and tree conservation bylaws. And with that, we were looking at uh, trying to get a thousand dollar set fines for part one offenses. Uh, unfortunately, the regional senior justice did not accept our applications on either um, stating that they were too high and we didn't meet the threshold to justify anything over um, uh, what we were asking for. So we resent it back uh, with some additional um, reasons on why we are looking for a thousand dollar set fines and they again sent it back approving it this time but at uh, lower set fines is what we were asking for as you'll see um, through the site alteration bylaw it's uh, eight hundred dollars across the board um, aside from a few uh, minor offenses and with the tree conservation it is set at six hundred dollars um, so that that is what uh, we've been approved for so going forward if we do choose to lay a charge as a part one offense for um, a site alteration or tree conservation um, bylaw contravention, uh, then that's what we would be using on, on top of the uh, victim five surcharges and whatnot. Um, so other than that, um, I think this is a good indicator that, uh, and we're already going through this process is to start a transition into the administrative monetary penalty system. Uh, so that report and bylaw should be coming uh, hopefully in the early months of 2023, um, along with our other uh, projects that uh, Mr. Pink had described uh, in the morning uh, today. So uh, other than that, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. To the committee, any questions from the committee? Right. Mm -hmm. Mayor Kelly. Uh, thank you. And uh, through you to Mr. Kennedy, what constitutes an offense uh, on the site alteration? Is, is, it, is it is the entire alteration field one offense or is it, uh, you know, is each individual displaced rock one offense or what constitutes an offense? Uh, through the chair. Uh, it's really up to our discretion on, on what we want to do. Um, normally, if there is major site alteration, we're, we're going through what's called an information and summons anyway. Um, so we bypass this whole part one process. Um, but if they're more minor offenses, um, this is where we can utilize these part ones 
um, and be able to just issue a fine. And that doesn't take away our, our abilities to still issue orders to remedy as well. Um, so we can use this in conjunction with those. Um, but as far as like deeming what an offense is really up to our discretion, um, you know, I wouldn't say that if they moved four big boulders that we're going to charge them four counts for site alteration in the same area, we're probably just going to use one in that situation. Any other questions? Uh, I think along that line, Mr. Kennedy, I have a question. Would it be 600 or whatever the fee is for every tree that gets cut down? Through the chair, yes, you, we could use that. Um, have we used it before? No, but that is that is an option if they cut, you know, if they cut 40 trees down and we confirm that they meet the definition of a tree, Technically, we could charge that same person 40 times over for the same offense. Very well. <laughs> All right. And they, they some of them can be pretty small trees, as I recall. Uh, very well. No more uh, one more one more shot for questions that somebody just thought of? No. Uh, Madam Clerk, I think we are we have uh, we have no un is there any unfinished business? I don't believe so. Councillor Moyer can't. Sorry, I didn't get there fast enough. I would hope that it's the philosophy of the department to issue that eight hundred or six hundred dollar fine on a per tree basis. If that's the right, if that's what's been, if that's what happened. I sense some hesitation. I just want to make sure I'm missing it because that's what the point of the tree cutting bylaw is for, to penalize people at a reasonable rate to you know, begin the process of adherence. So I'm just question. Mr. Kennedy. Uh, through the chair, I, I think we also have to be cognizant of the fact that 40 different pieces of paper um, for the same offense really is is going to take one hell of a long time to to get written up. Uh, and in that situation, as I was saying before, if someone cuts 40 trees down, I think it's more prudent for the municipality and the officer to charge under a part three offense and do an information and summons. And that's essentially one piece of paper and we can go for much higher fines. Um, in the site alteration tree conservation bylaws, if we go through part three, um, we can get up to on a first offense, we can get up to $100,000. I, I will be quite honest, um, you will never see that on a first offense. Um, but it is a big jump from what we used to have at the $10,000 per offense. Um, so it does give us a little bit more of uh, room to, uh, you know, ask for higher, you know, in the $30,000, $40,000 ranges for first offense rather than only asking for three or $4,000. Thank you very much. Mayor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and uh, and through you uh, generally, I, I guess this sort of highlights my uh, belief that uh, uh, this cannot be about penalizing, and it can't be about remediation because in in either case, it's too little, too late. Uh, this has to be about deterrence. It has to be combined with something like education or a heightened communication package or an awareness. It has to get this behavior has to stop. It's never good enough to run around and try to fix it after the fact. And I think uh, probably puts um, a much sharper focus on the need for at least looking at and considering a program of licensing the people who are on site and able to do this kind of damage. Uh, if they have more at risk than just simply 400 bucks or 400 bucks a tree, um, they're going to be a lot more considerate of the things we need them to be considerate of the environment and and you know the ways in life the way we've treated this place and respect this place i, I uh, th that's a long path down the road it's going to take a while to put stuff like that together but i really don't think in the environment we're in today there are, are many people whose last thought will be oh damn this will cost me 400 bucks uh, it, it needs to be a deterrent up front. We don't even talk about it. We don't even think about it. That just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, and so, um, you know, if, 
if anything is going to sort of exemplify that, consider that you're often working on multi-million dollar properties. Uh, and I've said it many times, I'll say it many more times. Um, even if we assess a complete hit of all of these um, penalties that we think are available to us, or that probably are available to us, it's still not much of a dent in the budget for an overall build or an overall uh, tear down and renovation. We need to figure out what other deterrents are available. And I think at some point we have to admit that licensing might be the best way to, to accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kelly. Uh, let me pause while people think and get their little yellow hand up for the last call. I think that's it, Mr. Kennedy, thank you very much. Um, we have one more motion, I believe, as we have no unfinished business. Uh, any new business? Anybody want to bring up some new business? All right. Um, is there? Did we miss something? No. All right. Okay, that's it. Before I read the adjournment motion, um, I know we a few words were said yesterday, uh, but today is um, our beloved clerks. And one might say, how could she be beloved? I've only known her since, what was it, August the 20 something or other. But uh, it's clear to me this, uh, uh, our, our clerk is a very talented one and uh, we are going to miss her. So this will be her last meeting on her last day and we get a chance to say goodbye and wish her well one more time. All right. So long, farewell, Avita <laughs> Shane, goodbye. I'll finish it later. <laughs> All right, there we go. Now, the final amend, or resolution for the day, Councillor, the singing Councillor Edwards and uh, Councillor Mazan. Councillor Edwards moved, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be resolved that the planning committee meeting adjourned at 2.42 p.m. Hmm? It's a record. A record. I'll add that in. <laughs> and the next regular planning committee will, will be held on Friday, January the 20th. That's Friday, not Thursday, at 9 a.m. electronically from the Council of Chambers Municipal Offices in Port Carling, Ontario. Further, it be resolved that the special planning committee meeting scheduled for Friday, the December the 16th at 9 a.m. be canceled as it is no longer necessary. All those in favor? Me against? Passed. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you on um, the 20th of January at the latest. Well, I guess we'll see you on the council.